Hello and welcome to this stream, uh, this somewhat surprise stream discussing the leaked documents that have allegedly come out of the Pentagon. Um, these documents are supposedly a daily briefing that uh, would be presented to the Joint Chiefs of Staff regarding the progress of the war in Ukraine. To analyze the contents of the documents in detail, I have with me here Raging Mandrel and Marcus Furious Pertinax. Um, who appeared in my last stream. Uh, so I have their links down in the description uh, if you want to check out their YouTube channel or blog or Twitter, uh, depending on which one. Uh, as far as the contents of the leaks go, I mean, we're going to analyze them as if they're legitimate. That's really the only way we can analyze them. Um, obviously, they could be fraudulent. Um, I think the general perspective on these leaks is that they're either uh, legit or legit fakes. So uh, from the military I've talked to, uh, everyone seems to believe that uh, a document would look like if, if it were real. Um, but we're just going to take it as given and talk about what is in the document itself. We're not really going to do a whole lot of speculation on like the motives of the leaker or you know whether or not they're fraudulent or anything like that. We're just going to discuss the documents. Um, so on that note, uh, I will begin sharing the screen. Um, one thing I want to take a look at, actually, just before we get into the leaks themselves, is uh, here's my blog that I'm going to write about this after the fact. Um, I want to look at this demographic document first, um, just to get a lay of Ukraine's population, because we're going to be looking at a lot of numbers here. So here's a demographic breakdown of um, Ukraine. Uh, as you can see, um, I don't think you can see my mouse, but towards the bottom, you can see um, how there's a population decline, basically. Um, the population of Ukraine has been in decline for actually around the past 10 years, as this graph illustrates. That's a pretty big issue. You can also see that their generally military age population has either left the country or has been killed in the country. Um, this is an enormous, I mean, this, this is a, this is an image of a nation without a future, basically is what we're looking at here. Um, Ukraine is a population of about 40 million. Uh, so just looking at this, if we cut that in half, actually more than in half, because you can see that's a large surplus of females in the country. Um, you can imagine why that is for certain eras of this chart. Um, so there's probably 20 million or so men or males in the country. Um, and then at least more than half of them at the moment are above 40. So in terms of Ukraine's potential military fighting population, um, they do not have the sort of numbers uh, that Russia Point it over first to Mandrel if you would comment on anything before we start look this document. Um, yeah. Um, so this is an interesting uh, point here, just because um, if you assume that because Ukraine has been at, at general mobilization for almost a year now, um, they are taking basically everybody who is of military age upwards till till age sixty, essentially till essentially retirement age. Um, and that isn't to say that they can't find ways of manipulating military manpower. Like you can take a 65 year old dude with, with, you know, diabetes and, and bad knees and throw him in a, in a truck as a driver or something, right. You don't have to make him an, an infantryman hiking 20 miles a day or anything like that. Um, so there is, there are ways that you can manage uh, a manpower deficit, but uh, yeah, this is pretty severe. Uh, Marcus, anything to say on this? Uh, not really. I mean, you guys have more or less touched on it, but uh, it is indicative of the fact that that, that sort of... Oh, could you just go back to that previous graph? Oh, sorry. <laughs> you said not right. really, and then I was ready <laughs> no, to move on. No, no. I just want to say that, yeah, obviously between sort of 20 and 35 is going to be your prime you know, age bracket for men who will serve in the army. And uh, someone actually said in the comments that Ukraine was already in decline prior to the war breaking out, uh, or rather was hitting some kind of a demographic cliff prior to the war breaking out. That would probably bring true. And now that the wars actually actually occurred and they've suffered an inordinate number of casualties, 
um, the vast majority of those military casualties would have been suffered within that age bracket of say even say 20 to 30 never mind 20 to 35 um because it always is worth mentioning too that usually your your you know your privates like your 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 grunts in uniform will often be a little younger than say your ncos and your officers but even then if officers are expected to sort of lead from the front there will obviously be a high amount of attrition amongst officers as well who tend to be a little bit older and uh i i think the, the statistics speak for themselves um and you know there's been several instances i mean uh, i don't want to go too much about history because i know we're talking about the leaks but you know you look at say like the french performance in world war one the aftermath of say the soviet union and germany after world war two uh france after the napoleonic era as well uh these were countries that experienced huge demographic chasms um you know following their their massive um you know efforts in wartime and it took it took, you know, well, actually, to, to some degree, the, the the Soviet Union sort of never actually recovered, and, and is still actually suffering from its repercussions now. Um, but these have lasting impacts, you know, economically, socially, culturally. Um, this, as a as a as a consequence, shouldn't actually be underestimated. That's that's all I would say on this, Charlie. All right. Um, well, let's go ahead and start looking at the actual documents. So. This is sort of the one everyone's been spreading around and talking about. This box in particular right here in the middle, total assessed losses. So we will start here. Now there's two versions of this little box. One of them was modified, likely by some sort of pro-Russian source, to swap the Ukrainian casualties for the Russian ones and inflate various statistics. But this, as far as I can tell, is what was originally pictured on this document. So what do we have here? These are actually KIA, killed in action statistics, which is interesting. Um, this is not casualties. Casualties are normally about five times higher than the KIA. Um, in regards to these statistics, I don't have much to say on them because no one is going to really know how many people actually died in Ukraine uh, for many years after the war. At best, we can really ballpark it. I think these figures are roughly in the correct ballpark, probably a bit of an overestimation in terms of the Russian KIA, probably a bit of an underestimation for Ukraine. Um, we can talk about the fighters and uh, rotary wing aircraft or helicopters, though that is really interesting um, to me. Um, do either of you have anything to add here? Yes, and, and that, that um, aircraft thing is also relevant because in the last week or so, we've seen um, the confirmation that various Eastern European countries are indeed going to be giving uh, things like MiG-29s. And I think Macedonia specifically has is um, is giving helicopters like there's, there's a huge push for aircraft right now. And and there's a reason for that, um, given uh, the types of equipment that is being given to Ukraine. Um, a lot of it is um, uh, going to be things that are usually equipped on aircraft like uh, the AIM-7 missile or, you know, uh, the Zuni rocket, um, things that are just kind of old, right? The Zuni rocket uh, has been around for a long time. Um, um, so, but it's it's an air to ground attack uh, weapon, right? And and so if, if you're expecting Ukraine to be able to use aircraft, of course, you're going to naturally give it uh, weapons that aircraft could use. Um, okay, I'm back. Did the screen share continue while my internet was? Yeah, no, it's, it's it's still the still the trouble. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so unfortunately, I missed uh, most of what you said there. Um, oh, but okay. I will. It's a, you don't have to repeat it for uh, the stream heard it. So let me jump over to. I'm writing a blog on this that I will publish shortly after for people who like to read. Uh, for my estimation, I was using this report called Military Balance, published by. Uh, one of these big global institutions uh, that basically catalogs the military of every country in the world. Uh, from 2021, I counted very roughly um, about 1,400 aircraft uh, and about 1,000 Russian helicopters, and then a little over 100 Ukrainian aircraft and 55 helicopters. So based on these numbers, which obviously aren't including all the statistics you calculated by hand, uh, we can see that, you know, Russia's lost less than 10% of their air force and Ukraine has lost about 50% of what they had in 2021 um, based on these numbers. So 
I would say that's pretty extreme. Uh, it's pretty clear that. Oh, uh, I think he cut out again. Oh no! That, that, uh, that, no. that, that, chop, that choppy Starlink again. <laughs> <laughs> Musk internet strikes again. Yeah, I might switch to my. Uh, I might switch to my four uh, G connection, but. Um, yeah, Ukraine's not going to have a serviceable air, air uh, force after another year of uh, casualties of this rate. Uh, it's fifty percent mm. after a year. Actually, just so, just as a quick point, I just want to say something in the comment, Jay Blake here. Every war since Vietnam has been televised, and yet not this one. That's yeah, a very good point, actually. I kind of feel the same. Um, it's it's noticeable, and that whenever one does see footage, it's always you know, shall I say. The embellishment is obvious. Um, yeah, no, I, I, t I tend to agree. You know, it's, it's the whole notion that, you know, we, we should expect the sort of live streamed in HD on YouTube and yet, you know, we get like these fuzzy, <laughs> you know, videos and like, you know, pixelated long distance shots of, you know, hard to see footage. Mm. Very good point indeed, sir. Uh, anything else on the total assess losses box? Uh, yeah, I have one thing. Um, yeah. and, and I generally agree with your assessment, Charlemagne, that we will not know the true death toll of um, this conflict until well after it's over. Uh, I do have, um, you know, a bit of a qualm with these uh, uh, total assessed losses here. Um, it, it does kind of make sense from the angle that usually when you, you have an attacking force, um, you're required to have two or even three times the amount of manpower and equipment um, that the defender does because you're going to take higher rates of casualties. And so generally speaking, you'd expect this kind of lopsided casualty ratio to, to pretty much be in keeping with general military situations. Um, so when this, the, when this slide gets brought up to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, um, this is what they're going to be looking at, and, and the numbers make sense. And so when you have some like lieutenant commander or commander who's assigned to staff duty with the Joint Chiefs, um, this is what they're, they're going to be calculating. And, um, and this is the, the kind of thinking and the kind of logic that is going to, uh, to drive them to come to the conclusions of these numbers. I kind of think that these are, are slightly lowballed on both sides. Um, uh, I, I just... For some reason, I, I see this very low number of 16,000 or 16, 17,000 K, and I, I just kind of think, well, Russia has a significant artillery advantage. And if you, if you think about um, firepower um, and how artillery has an outsized role in firepower on the battlefield in, in the terms of how much damage it can do, um, this number, this doesn't pass the smell test for me. Um, so I don't know. Um, I just am very skeptical with this box right here. That's all I, I, have to say. I do agree that, uh, Russia allegedly has a 10 to one artillery advantage in some places. Um, so given that, uh, the overwhelming number of casualties in modern war is caused by artillery, this does seem a little low on the Ukrainian side. Um, so I agree that, uh, it, it probably is low. I mean, Especially when uh, it seems casualty as oh thousand for Ukraine. Oh no, you're you're cutting a gown again, Charlemagne. They don't really add up to me. So let you, me. You, uh, let's... I'm sorry, Charlemagne. You, you cut out again, man. Yeah, let me switch to my. Uh hotspot internet real quick hopefully it doesn't crash okay um fingers crossed <laughs> um, right well imagine I'll, I'll put something to you just why charlie sorts out his internet and that is because i mean for those who you know follow what i do I, I tend to endlessly talk about um well when i'm talking about greece and Rome, right. i'm talking about generally the second world war and that's and the case is that the three to one a, a, a attacking advantage is required is I, I, I agree that it's largely true, but it doesn't always necessarily have to be that way depending on the disposition of forces. Like, Say, for example, if one side over another has a distinct advantage in air superiority or indeed has the advantage of army aviation, 
which it can use as indirect fire support against advancing, advancing troops. There's also the consequence as well of, 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 of um, what you might call overrun or, you know, rapid encirclement, which we saw basically the, the Russians did start this war in a maneuver way of fighting, you know, to, 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 I hate to butcher a, a, a phraseology, but what the Germans would probably call Bewegungskrieg, you know, movement warfare. And then once they decided to withdraw from their northern, you know, pushes, you know, from Kiev, from um, Chernigov, from Sumy, and redeploy themselves, what was it in like a, a, April, I think, sort of March, April, May, after those conversations mm -hmm. in, in, in Istanbul were torpedoed, they then went to a methodical sort of firepower incremental style of warfare, which they've sustained since. Um, now, losses can be incurred, obviously, when units attempt headlong advances. Uh, and generally, as the, as, as the Russians were doing, they're sort of uh, initiating these spearheads without sort of flank support, literally beelining down highways. I mean, I remember we were talking about this like at the very onset of the war. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, I, think, I believe you and I were on the same stream and, I, and you were sort of saying like these are the reports of how the Russians were actually attacking in this way. Whereas now they've totally reverted to a, a, a almost the mirror, the mirror opposite of maneuver warfare to sort of incremental firepower, you know, method, met, methodological, you know, uh, infantry advances with massive firepower support. And um, that means you're not going to get the, the overruns of the encirclements, but at the same time, you are exposing an enemy who does have an, uh, a, a, an air force and army aviation uh, disadvantage, a, a huge one in the case of Ukraine. And then just in terms of the ability to deploy that firepower on the front and to sort of sustain, to saturate particular strong points with this artillery fire. And we've seen the, the Russians, like Charlie said before, there's been in some places a, a 10 or even a 12 to 1 advantage. It's more often been, say, like a 4 or 5 to 1 advantage, be it the actual number of artillery guns or the number of shells being fired. But I, 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 I'm I, struggling to sort of see the veracity of these numbers in that sense. Do you know what I'm sort of getting at, Mandrill? You know, like mm -hmm. the, the tenor of my point? Yeah. I mean, I, I can I can see where you're going with it, um, for sure. Uh, my, my one hesitation with these numbers, too, is that um, I, I've done a lot of, of calculations for the Ukraine war um, just in my spare time on, on casualties, right? And I generally, when I see this um, this amount of, of ground vehicles and, and everything killed. And if, if, you, if you assume that, okay, at, at most there's probably like, if you assume that a BMP carries like eight guys in it uh, with crew, that's like 10 guys. Okay, one BMP goes down. If it's full of people, that's, you know, 10 people. Um, a tank has like, what, three, maybe four. Um, so I see that in, and I get... I am very skeptical of of these numbers just because, um, especially on the Russian side, because I've been following Oryx for a very long time, and I do not trust their numbers whatsoever. And I can easily, easily imagine the U.S. intelligence community doing a very, very lazy thing of just believing uh, the Oryx uh, kill count uh, for Russian vehicles. Um And I have my reasons for being skeptical, which I've, I've laid out elsewhere. But yeah, I, I just... When I see these numbers, I, I'm just I raise an eyebrow to them. That's all. So let's move on to other parts of the doc because I think this one's just too speculative, speculative to be honest. Um, but let's read some fine print. So right here we okay. can see uh, maximum Rus combat power includes Russian pre-conflict battalion generation capability plus all auxiliary forces has in Ukraine. That'll be useful later. Um, also mm -hmm. important is we're going to go over here. And we'll note that the acronym RLF stands for Russia-led forces. Um, TDF is Territorial Defense Forces. This will come up later, so just keep those acronyms in your head for now. So for now, I'm going to zoom back out, and we will go and just, look over here. Just on that point, Charlie, can I just, in that line there, it sort of it said, what was it, the, the Territorial Defense Forces, the the Russian led mm -hmm. forces and then Wagner. I just yes. want to make a point because a lot of people have made a fuss of this. I dare say they're just using the phonetic spelling of Wagner because obviously yeah, we yes. see a W and we think, oh, Wagner, but no, like the way it's actually pronounced is Wagner. And I dare say just for phonetic ease, they've just used V in place of W. It's yeah, not. Yeah, I found that weird. I, I, don't, too, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think but... it's fake on that basis. It's just that it's phonetically 
how it's pronounced. And I, I, maybe for ease of use in intelligence circles, they just use the V because it is pronounced Wagner. I don't know. I'm just surmising. I suspect that is correct. And I, I believe that as well, that it's not like a sign that these are fake. It's just for convenience yeah. because look, let's face it. Yeah. A lot of people aren't going to know how to pronounce it. And if correct. people are saying Wagner and some are saying Wagner, they might think it's different things and it might confuse yeah. people. And you don't want that. Uh, when war is happening. Yeah, exactly. So mm-hmm. let's go look closer at what we have here. So what is this? This is Ukrainian forces at, as of 1st of March, right? And what is assessed is that Ukraine has 34 brigades, maneuver brigades, uh, maneuver brigades being the sort of main regulars <coughs> that are going to use for combat on the battlefield. Fires is artillery. So they have 13 units of artillery. Um, they're brigade size. At least three of them are brigade sized. Um, these two seem to have a different symbol. Um, we don't have to get too detailed into that. They also have 27 territorial defense forces brigades. Um, these are going to be uh, like the militias that were turned into regular units, basically. Um, these are basically your bullet sponges. Um, so the TDFs are the bullet sponges. Your maneuver brigades are your professional army that you definitely don't want to lose. Um, so I don't see any reason to doubt these numbers as they're coming from the side that is, uh, you know, owns these units. Uh, also, uh, you know, we don't know what the strength of each of these are. Obviously a lot of these are depleted, um, as we can perhaps read about later. Oh, okay. Let's scroll That's down. Funny. Okay. So. Additionally, on this document, we also have the Russian battalions count. The Russian military in these documents is counted in battalions rather than brigades. Um, Potential maximum combat power, 544 battalions. Um, I am not sure if this is uh, in the theater or like the entire Russian military. Um, It would seem weird if it referred to the entire Russian military. Uh, but maybe it does. I don't know. Um, committed to the conflict, 527 of 544 battalions. Um, and we can see the breakdown here as well of what Russia has in terms of its maneuver battalions, reserve units, and auxiliaries. And then we can see a further breakdown inside of the Ukraine of those 527 battalions, 474 in Ukraine. We can see the number that are combat effective and ineffective. Combat ineffective can mean they've taken too many casualties to be effective. It can mean they're out of ammunition, you know, anything that would no longer make it an effective fighting force. Um, So, you know, we can see more than half are combat effective, um, especially in the artillery battalions, like most of them still are. Uh, Probably because the artillery battalions are not taking as many casualties because they're not going to be on the front lines. Um, So does anyone have anything to say on this section of the document? Manual. Okay, very Don't good. So. Uh, no, I'm good. One one okay. other thing on this page before we get to the more interesting stuff is over here. Uh, yeah, this this box right here was interesting. February 26, space cyber elect- uh, electronic warfare. Um, Russian airspace forces assessed it successfully diverted a Ukrainian missile from its intended course due to employment of electronic warfare equipment. And then it's marked top secret. I think SI is signals intelligence released to USA five eyes. Um, that's just an interesting bit of information. I think that they were capable of doing that. Anything else to observe here? I guess before we skip over this, the rest of this document, um, like what do we have up here? Top secret. I don't know what HSP is. I don't know what SIG is. I don't know what TK is. I don't know what most of these are, actually. No foreign is no foreign eyes. Um, yeah, so so this is a document that isn't supposed to be released to any foreign countries, and not even allies, basically. Right. Um, so this is this is like extremely um, the, the the language that the military and the DoD generally use when they have a like classified information um, spillage or leakage. Um, 
is that uh, the, the language for top secret being released is that this is a, a grave damage or grave harm to national security interests, right? Um, so the fact that this got released uh, is uh, really bad um, if it is a genuine document, of course. Um, that's if it if this is a genuine like leak, then uh, that's extremely terrible for for the U.S. All right, so now let's move on to this one, <clears throat> and this is where things get more interesting uh, because this sort of relates to the spring offensive, the alleged spring offensive. So what are we looking at here? We're looking at projections of the ground conditions um, in Ukraine based on the progression of the seasons. Um, so we have these three lines. We have a, it might be hard to see, but we have a blue line in the south, a yellow line above it, and then northmost we have a green line. And then down at the bottom here, we have this legend uh, that has corresponding sections that relate to the blue line, the yellow line, and the green line. <clears throat> so going through this, what we can see is um, in March, when this was released, uh, all of the ground of the blue line was still partially frozen. Uh, today, in April, um, the blue line is still uh, mud. And at the end of April, the blue line will go to favorable conditions. That's what it says in green is favorable. So by the end of this month, 1st of May, we can say everything at the blue line at the bottom and south of it is going to have favorable conditions. Uh, the yellow line, you can see, and then the green line at the top will not end the muddy season until you know early to mid-May. Um, so this is relevant because this is this relates directly to uh, whether or not Ukraine can engage in a viable offensive without getting its vehicle stuck in the mud. Um, would anyone like to add anything to that explanation? Nope, that seems uh, pretty concise to me. Um, I think we can go ahead and move on. Cool. Yeah, but bear, so that, have... bear, bear those dates in mind, though, for sure. Mm. Yes, this the, uh, yeah. particularly the blue line. Remember, the blue line at the end of April mm. is when the muddy season ends. That mm. one, I think, is the most important. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. uh, 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 just to say too that I mean, you know, for those who aren't up to speed, which I assume is probably not the majority of the, the audience now, because we've all got a fair grasp of the of the ge geography and sort of where this war is taking place, and this has been a, a, a time. <laughs> A, a time enduring problem with fighting this part of the world. You know, Napoleon confronted it, the Germans confronted in World War One, the Germans confronted in World War Two, and particularly as warfare becomes increasingly sort of motorized and I suppose mechanized in our time, you know, even tracked vehicles to a point will be, will find their capacity limited with the sheer degree in which the mud does affect these regions uh, because the because of the amount of sort of snowfall and the degree to which that the ground hardens over winter i mean this mud doesn't just hang around for for a week or two you know it actually takes a long time for it to dry out and whilst it's wet and whilst it's muddy and that's not that's not even including the the rains which tend to fall in these seasons as well makes it increasingly um you know of, of a hazard and very much is a consideration when when a one side or another is determining whether to engage in sort of a, an offensive operation or to go on the move because basically until the, the ground either hardens up through cold or dries up through heat makes this operation extremely difficult yeah and and if i could just um um uh continue on that point there um a lot of people in our circles are very impatient well, why isn't russia moving why are, why is it taking so long like wh why are they going for this very slow approach well i mean if you if you look at the weather um you will see that it you cannot perform any sort of offensive action like with motorized or mechanized units um in the winter time when you have muddy ground right and and from what i understand um from uh people like uh, uh colonel douglas mcgregor who's who's been making the rounds um in his youtube and and commentary circles and things but um he was saying that essentially the ground in so in ukraine never really truly froze this winter um uh which is an interesting thing to think about um 
at least. Um, so that whether that's true or not, who knows? Um, it maybe that's less true. That's more true in the south than in the northern part. Um, but anyway, well, we can see right here, even at the blue line, uh, partially frozen on the left, partially frozen on the right. Um, there was only a tiny part of February where the blue line was actually frozen. And obviously, if we go further south into actually Zaporizhia and Kherson, you can see that, yeah, it was probably never fully frozen, which means um, no offensive is going to be possible from anybody. Um, so, and, you know, you might think like, oh, like, can't tanks just go through the mud? Well, tanks are really, really heavy, and they will also sink in the mud. Um, for anyone who's gone through their own muddy season, like uh, I just went through, actually, uh, you can understand that it's not really possible to launch a major mechanized operation um, in the muddy season because it's just going to get your units destroyed. Um, there's no way around that. Uh, your vehicles are mm. going to get stuck and your people are going to die. Um, so it makes absolutely no sense to attack um, during the muddy yeah. season. Even at the small sort of like tactical level of, you know, when you're talking, say like, you know, squad squad strength or platoon strength, even sort of company strength of, of, of a fighting unit. You know, it's, it's one thing for a handful of men to, you know, jog around like a building or a structure and try and avoid fire. But, you know, when you're talking about moving men at that kind of level you know like i said from sort of platoon or company strength up and they're inundated by mud if they're not sort of like in a city environment or a town environment where there's paved roads or there's you know bricks or asphalt or something to move on you know these men are going to move at a slower sort of rate mud constricts a person's ability to sort of you know move on the battlefield and to take cover and to avoid fire be it from you know, opposing soldiers or indeed from enemy artillery. Even just those little things people tend to ignore. But mud it affects everything from the mechanized vehicles, from the supply trucks to the movement of infantry on foot. It's a, you know, it's a very profound problem that all you have to do is read history books and you'll see countless testimonies about it. Uh, we can also notice that this document actually has a lower classification level. It's only secret and it can be released to USA and Five Eyes. Uh, but now let's move on yeah. to the really really interesting one which is this one um so the u.s allied and partner um uaf combat power bill we can see here spring offensive in the upper right this is basically the planned units um that are supposed to participate and allow this so-called spring offensive to happen uh so where shall we start first we'll just i'll point out in case you can't see it <clears throat> Um, it says spring offensive up here uh, in the upper right. Um, so that's where that terminology, terminology is coming from. Zooming back out, what are we actually looking at here? We're basically looking at a manifest of nine brigades that are being constructed. Um, before we continue, does anyone want to say anything in introduction to this document? I'll, I'll say an introduction. Um, so... Um... If, if you anybody who has military experience will be fam intimately familiar with um, the way that uh, the U.S. military likes to use PowerPoint, and and if you've ever seen military PowerPoints or scheduling, uh, this is this is very close to the style that you would see. Um, when people say that this document isn't genuine or or it's fake, or it's totally fake or something, uh, this is this is the, the the sheet that I would say would make it seem real to me. Um, so this doesn't seem like, like it's fake. This, this seems like an actual genuine document that, that got leaked uh, unintentionally <clears throat> just by the style. Yes. And I've heard that echoed by every single person who is familiar with this type of document. So this is what leads me to uh, believe that it is a legitimate document. Um, so what what is this? So according, I'll just read the text up at the top here. Um, is It says, 12 combat credible brigades can be generated for the spring offensive, three internally by Ukraine, not depicted, and nine are trained and equipped by U.S. allied and partner. Uh, of the nine, six will be ready for the 31st of March, and the final three by the 30th of April. Uh, so... To review, um, there's nine brigades here listed that are be basically being constructed outside of Ukraine itself, and then an additional three will be provided uh, entirely from within Ukraine. 
Um, so we can actually even stop there and talk about why train them outside of Ukraine. Um, we can see um, there's a training timeline here that goes from January to February. To You're going to train them outside of Ukraine because if they get trained in Ukraine, Russia can uh, bomb them <laughs> and destroy all the equipment too. Um, so by training, literally shipping brigades or, or the brigades in making to uh, other or to NATO countries, um, you can train these units in complete safety because Russia is not attacking those countries. They can't attack those countries. Um, so finishing the, the top, and then I'll uh, let you jump in. Uh, of the nine brigades, six will be ready by the 31st of March, three by April 30th. Equipment delivery times will impact training and readiness in order to meet this timeline. So translating that, equipment delivery times will impact training and readiness in order to meet the timeline. What that says is the timeline will be met and whatever sacrifices must be made in terms of training and readiness, that's that's just going to be cut, right? We're going to meet this deadline regardless of uh, what our actual readiness state is when it's completed. Um, so does anyone have anything to add before we start really getting into details? Uh, yeah, that's another d detail that makes me um, perceive of this document as genuine because as anybody who has had military experience will tell you, this is exactly how the brass at the top uh, thinks. Um, it, it For them, it's more important that you're materially and equipment ready. And if training has to suffer in order to meet deadlines, then so be it. And that's how the U.S. military likes to operate sometimes. Um, so that's that's that. Um, there is uh, something that we should probably touch on also, Charlemagne. The, the next sentence I think you're about to get to. So, um, uh, Yeah, so uh, total equipment required for nine is 253 tanks, 381 uh, mechanized units, 480 motorized units, and 147 artillery plus 571 up-armored HMM WVs. Um, is that Humvees? Yeah, that's a Humvee. Okay. Uh, M Marcus, you had something? No, no, go, go through the document, and then I'll, I'll, I'll chime in at the end. Just a tangent to right, Mandrel's point about readiness, but we'll go through the list and we'll come back to it. Okay, well, that, that was it, reading the, uh, the top-level introduction. So, yeah, go ahead and make your tangent. We yeah, can spend no, plenty of time on this. This is oh, no, we're going to be on of this course, for a while. Of course, there's there, there's always a there's always a, an interesting sort of point of um uh, of distinction to make between you know notions of being ready and the impact of units not being ready or indeed waiting too long to be ready. And I, I know I tend to utilize a lot of historical um, examples from the Eastern Front of World War Two. There's actually sort of three small screenshots that you can take from uh the Ostfront experience and sort of applied here and the first thing is that when the germans actually initiate initiate operation barbarossa in the summer of 1941 most of their units are at full strength uh they obviously have expanded the army after the campaigns in france and the low countries and you know, the opening campaigns of the war um it's not it's not 100 percent full strength but it's pretty close to full strength um, and most of the divisions that they send into the, the Soviet Union, you know, have their full complement of, you know, support battalions and, you know, sort of mixed organic support units, etc. Now, when they fail in the capture of Moscow and the pushback after Operation Typhoon in the winter of, the, of December 41 and into January and February 42, um, the Germans then sort of plan for the next summer offensive, which ends up being Case Blue, which is the operation against that eventually leads up to the Battle of Stalingrad. And there's a very good video by um, the history, his, uh, what is it, military history visualized that uh, that Austrian gentleman who has a, mm. a primarily World War II channel, which is actually a pretty, pretty good oh, I channel. Love, I, I, I love his I'm channel. Sure. He's great. You know, yeah, he's, he's great. excellent. And he, he does a really good video on the breakdowns of German readiness of of uh, comparing 41 to 42. And even with Barbara, uh, sorry, even prior to Case Blue, when they reinforced the divisions of Army Group South, a large number of divisions are not even. Well, I don't want to say not, are not close to full fighting strength, but are, are still diminished. Even though they've been reinforced and re-equipped and have been refitted, many of these divisions are, you know, at 
70 percent some of them even have equip, equipment shortages with even down to like 60 percent strength they're, they're not even they're not close to 100 percent fighting strength and still the germans fling them forward and they still manage to overrun and you know surround a lot of soviet unions and they uh, and certainly in the first few weeks of the campaign achieve major success and achieve a large number of their objectives you know they they reach stalingrad they capture Voronezh, they break out into the into the southern caucasus um but even then what you do see is rather than be able to expand on an entire front line uh you know the entire theater i suppose as was the case in 41 the germans are merely pushing in the southern part of the, uh, the of the front and even then these units are only able to push ever so far until they outrun their supply they you know run out of, you know they're, they're limited for fuel they're limited for ammunition they're limited for reinforcements and then obviously you know we know about stalingrad i don't need to go there they pull out the caucuses at the end of 42 and the six armies lost around Stalingrad. And, and the, the the third point I'll make is the preparation for Kursk. Um, the Kursk counteroffensive basically takes place in the in the context that the the Soviets have a, an enormous success with Operation Uranus in surrounding the six armies of Stalingrad. They sort of capture 91,000 German troops and they sort of basically destroy the guts of Army Group South. And come the sort of March, April of... 43, von Manstein manages to stabilize that part of the front. And in fact, the Soviets, in an attempt to completely overrun the Germans, and this is where actually this fighting occurs in a very similar part of the of, of the world. Um, you know, the, the, the Soviets actually try and beeline for places like um, Slavyansk and Kramatorsk, but actually from a, from the, the northern and eastern direction rather than from the south. Um, and, and the Germans actually do stop them. And what the Germans actually do is, because they're able to sort of mobilize um strong armored reserves and mechanized infantry able to counterattack um what they call the 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 uh the third battle of kharkov and then the the cap recapturing of belgorod and that sets up the stage for kursk but what the germans actually do here is not wanting to be in this situation where they found themselves in case blue the germans at the insistence of you know the of the fear himself actually hold position and the Germans want to deploy their best weapons that are in the production line. They want to build up a great number of, you know, these tiger tanks and panther tanks and elephant tank destroyers and Nusshorn tank destroyers, etc. And they put off, they put off, they put off, they put off this offensive. And the problem is for the Germans is they gave the Soviets all the time in the world. They completely telegraphed where the, the offensive would be. And the Soviets dug in extremely, you know, densely, uh, minefields, defensive belts, uh, pillboxes you know kill zones with anti-tank guns you know artillery positions even to the point where the soviets are actually deploying reserve armies in various sectors of this front to sort of be able to counter-attack wherever the germans would 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 thrust into and you know kursk ended up being a operational failure for the germans and they expanded a lot of their you know very recent and very good military equipment that was hard for them to replace and then the soviets ended up smashing through army group south in the latter part of 1943 and in the early months of 44 and i guess the argument there for the the the, the curse thing is that one telegraphing an offensive is a bad idea against the opposition you either have to launch it when it is expedient or you just have to give up the ghost and not launch that offensive else you just throw your men against you know <laughs> uh, you know a cliff face essentially and the second thing is is that um you know you end up weakening your own forces for a headlong offensive that has a small chance of success and then exposing yourself to counterattack. and i actually think that the ukrainians find find themselves in a similar position now whereas if they fling themselves into these russian positions having telegraphed you know one of two or three places that they could conceivably launch an offensive i dare say the ukrainians uh will have a tough going trying to attack at an artillery disadvantage at an army aviation disadvantage and then the other thing is they're getting all this equipment from nato but how much do they have in reserves you know if they start suffering breakdowns and destruction of their leopard you know their leopard tanks or the the, the british challenger tanks where are the replacements well i can answer that question i can answer that question um we are we are providing the maintenance for them for all of that we are nato is no, no, no. I know we're providing the maintenance. What I'm saying is once they start suffering attrition and battlefield losses, you know, there isn't there isn't a hundred leopard ones sitting in Kiev that they can throw another tank crew into and send to the front. Like what I'm saying is what they've got is what they've got. They don't really have strategic reserves in this context, if you get what I mean, Mandrel.
Anyway, I think we could uh, move on to the next part of the slide here. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Well, on the on the lack of reserves, we'll uh, get to that momentarily. So first, what do we have here? It's just secret release to Finland, Ukraine, Five Eyes, NATO. So basically, everyone can see this. Uh, importantly, on this right hand box, we have here in purple delivered in country, in blue delivery on track. So basically, anything purple or blue that we see and what we're going to examine next is fine. Yellow is no delivery scheduled timeline i can't read that word basically yellow is a problem um orange is no commitment which effectively means the unit only exists on paper and does not actually exist um so if you see anything in orange it doesn't exist as of february 28th or march 1st um which is when this was last updated if we if i move a little right here we can see a line right here that goes down the middle 20th of February. So that's where we are in the timeline when this document was composed. So keeping what I just said in mind about the colors, let's zoom back out. And now let's start all the way on the left. So we'll zoom in on the left over here. What do we have? We have nine rows, each describing a brigade. The brigades all have a number. These are new brigades. And they have each have three battalions in them. Uh, this right here is mechanized infantry uh, in the top. Uh, in the middle, we have um, artillery, and then beneath that, we have armor. Um, uh, a circle is, is armor. A circle is armor, and the dot is artillery. Um, we can also see that not all of these, as I scroll down, are infantry. But it's all infantry, armor, artillery, infantry, armor, artillery, infantry, armor, artillery. Uh, here's another mechanized infantry. Um, note that even the infantry uh, the infantry battalions that are not mechanized are still motorized, which is normal. Uh, they're not just yes, and, walking around on foot. They do have transport. Yes, um, and the difference that we can, that I, I think we kind of mentioned um, intuitively uh, in our previous discussion on this uh, privately is that mechanized is um, defined as tracked vehicles, so M113s, Whereas uh, motorized is wheeled vehicles like Humvees. Um, so it doesn't mean to say that, oh, it's, this is a useless asset or it's, it's like worse or anything. It's just, it's, it has slight limitations. And obviously I'm, I'm sure a Humvee is probably cheaper to construct than an M113s or, or other armored vehicles. I actually missed this before. Equipment details on, what is that, 3-7? What page is this? This hmm. is... Oh, this is three seven. Maybe uh, that's yes. huh. it's, Inter interesting. Yeah. Okay, so let's let's take a look at these left hand columns though. So what do we have here? In this first brigade, um, we can notice that seventeen nondescript tanks are orange TBD. They're just missing. So this brigade yeah. does not have its tanks. Uh, they have T sixty fours, thirteen of them. Um, that were but they Ukrainian. don't have they don't have the last seventeen tanks, right? They need they need like what is this, 30? Around 30 is what they're looking for, it looks like? Yes, uh, presumably M1 Abrams is what those are. Um, and they're not there, uh, so that's a problem. Um, I don't know what all of these non-US items are. I, I can um, speak to that. I can speak okay. to that. So, yeah, 90 BMP. Uh, those have been given by Poland and Czechia. Um, those are your general BMP variant. Um your typical Soviet APC, essentially, um, to either it's a, a tracked vehicle, essentially, because this is a mechanized brigade, right? Um, and then 12 AS 90s. Uh, I want to say, um, I want to say that's artillery. And then 2S1 is definitely artillery. That's uh, the Gvozdika. That's a, a old Soviet self-propelled gun. Um, yeah, those must be artillery because they all go in order. We can see on the yes. second brigade we have 99 M2 Bradleys, uh, which is a lot. Um, and then, then we have the tanks listed. Yep, that's the that's the uh, the Slovenian M55S actually, as you can see SLV, right? Um, that's basically a T55 that's been upgunned with a NATO 105 millimeter cannon. Uh, it's been given a slightly upgraded engine um, to increase its horsepower, and it's also been given a, a reactive armor on top of that. So it's not a T-55 per se, 
Uh, it is upgraded a little bit, but how how much better is it compared to other main battle tanks? It's probably one of the worst tanks that you could actually have qualitatively. All right, we have 28 of them. So, you know, people have been making fun of the t 55 showing up on the Russian side. So as far as the armor goes in the second brigade, it's not great. Um, the first brigade has better armor, but only 13 tanks, which is um, almost only a third of what we're actually looking for here. Um, this brigade here is not mechanized. As we can see, these Max Pros, um, there's another name for these, but the Max Pros, they're basically this giant, truck with like a grenade launcher or 50 caliber machine gun on top of them yeah um, they're actually they're called mraps um okay, which i yeah, forget i forget what what the acronym stands for but it's it's basically a a um a american response to ieds and and mines basically um it's an armored an armored transport vehicle essentially a wheeled armored transport vehicle with a 50 caliber machine gun on top also, it's a fairly large target and not really appropriate to this environment, to be honest, um, because it was designed with an entirely different war in mind. Uh, but uh, we're just yeah. handing them over. And, yes. and especially in the context, and I'm sure, Mandrel, you'll agree that specifically in the context of a side that is at a at a distance five power and an aviation disparity, they'd make very plump targets. Where, say, for example, if they use an intended role where they were be used by, say, the Americans in, you know, deployed conflicts against sort of second and third world power as well. They would norm normally be in, under an umbrella of, you know, air superiority, you know, firepower superiority, and the ability to def defend from far. They wouldn't be vulnerable in the case that they will find themselves in Ukraine. Would you agree with that? Generally, yeah. Yep. All right. um, now, cool. in these two brigades, we also could see they have U.S. artillery, um, they have M109s and M119s. One of those is uh, mobile artillery um, or self-propelled. Do you remember which one it is? Yeah, the M109 is a self-propelled gun. Um, I can't remember what the M119 is off the top of my head. Um, that D30, though, that uh, was up at the, the top brigade there, that's uh, that's Soviet-era artillery in 122 millimeter. That'll become important later. Mm -hmm. yeah, it will. Uh, and then we can see the uh, the fame that leopards are here. The leopards are actually uh, delivered. So we have mm -hmm. 32 leopard tanks from Germany, Canada, and Poland, all here uh, in this brigade. So we can actually say that this brigade um, is fairly well equipped. Uh, they're not mechanized, so that's a bit of a downside, but they have good tanks. Um, yes. Um, oh, I, one second. Uh, that M one nineteen. That's a uh, that's towed artillery in one hundred and five millimeter. So that's definitely useful for the Ukrainians because we've given them a lot of those. Okay. Um, uh, oh, just by the way, man. Just in the comments, uh, Sean Whelan's uh, got us here. Uh, MRAP, mine resistant, uh, ambush protected. <laughs> oh, course, right. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And yeah, if you've ever seen one of these in person, the the MRAPs. I mean, they're very tall these are not low profile uh definitely a good target for any sort of like anti-tank weapon and that would just like obliterate it um so mm. yeah what do we have here i don't know what any of these are except for the t-64s okay uh a lot of these um great britain's uh complement uh to the ukrainian conflict has been uh very mixed They've given a lot of, of um, different uh, mechanized or motorized units. Basically, um, with what you see is what you get here. Um, uh, I can't remember what a CVRT is, um, but the Senators, that's a, that's a Canadian version of a Humvee, basically. Um, it's got a slight bit more armor. Um the Bulldogs, Huskies, those are our other Ukrainian MRAPs or, or other kind of motorized vehicles. And M113s, that's the general Vietnam era um, uh, APC with a 50 caliber on top. It's basically our version of a, of a, a BTR, essentially, except it, it has tracks and, or treads instead of uh, uh, wheels. And the, the FH-70 are... Uh, Basically, sort of 70s, 80s, Cold War era uh, heavy artillery. I believe they were designed uh, be, uh, a joint design between Germany and Britain. I think Rheinmetall might have designed them. And 
the you see the Italian flag there. They've been built by OTO Malara, who also built the main gun tanks for the Italian Arietta tank. Um, and that's one fifty-five millimeter artillery, if memory says me correct. If um, if I'm not mistaken, too, the FH seventy was also used by the French, I believe. Um, it's it's the usual NATO standard one hundred fifty-five millimeter yeah. artillery yeah. capable piece. Yeah, but this is also yeah. interesting, and and it's a detail I didn't notice in my my autism here. Um, uh, Italy has been very. Um, they've been. V- They've given small arms. They've said they've given small arms, um, but the quantities and and especially the the stuff that they've given like hasn't really been announced in any quantity. This is the first time I'm hearing of them having given artillery pieces, um, yeah. which is yeah, pretty and significant. And, uh, yeah, and also the Italians, to my knowledge, haven't sent over any tanks. None of none of the none of the Arietta tanks or the sort of light fighting vehicles, or armored personnel carriers from the Italian army have been sent over, to my knowledge. So far, it's just um, being small arms and artillery. Yeah, they have they have given a couple a couple little um uh hum, like their version of a Humvee, right? That's the older stuff, right? Um, but yeah, the numbers we don't we we don't know. So, um, we can also note on that line the there are four missing from Estonia, so minor shortage in artillery pieces there. Moving on to poor thirty second brigade, thirty uh, second brigade really sucks. Um, they've got the ninety M wraps. They've got 10 T-72s, 20 missing tanks, and then just um, 12 D-30s. So this is not a well-equipped brigade at all. Um, it's it's just not ready. It's not, yeah, it won't be is, ready. Yeah, the, it's a it's a it's a one bata- it's a single battalion fighting brigade essentially. <laughs> oh, and, and, and and look look at even the max scores. It says 63 out of 90 on hand. The rest oh, by I March. Missed that. Interesting. So they they only have two thirds of the MRAPs that they're that supposed said, to have. It's, the delivery is on March. time, at least. So yeah. they probably have them since they didn't yellow it out. But mm. that could have impacted their training. Uh, we'll have to remember to look back at that. All right, what else do we have? This was also just uh, these are just more wheeled vehicles. The, I'm presuming the, this is this is the the Anglo French uh, fighting brigade. Yeah, the, the yeah. <laughs> French, French <vehicles. laughs> Yeah, so that's um, all Mastiff, Mastiff and Husky, Mastiff Wolf. That's all, like that's all the mixed vehicle British complement that I was talking about earlier. It's all MRAPs and and their version of like personnel carriers, and then the same thing with the Senators. That's that's the Canadian contribution. Except they are missing. Uh, they're committed, but they are they are they're not. We don't know when they're going to be delivered. <clears throat> These guys also have no artillery. The as of the end of February. The delivery timeline on their D-30s is just, we don't know. Um, they're missing a ton of tanks, uh, more than half their tanks. The AMX-10, is that a French tank? That's, it's debatable whether it even could be called a tank. Um, it is it is a wheeled, um, it's it's listed as, as um, like a reconnaissance vehicle, basically, Um it has a 105 uh, millimeter gun, which ironically enough is not compatible with 105 millimeter NATO standard tank ammunition. Um, it's like a proprietary round. The, um, the French have to have their own, of course, because yes. that would otherwise not be French. Yeah, and and it doesn't even have. Um, it's not even like gyro stabilized, so it it has to come to a complete stop before it can fire its gun, and it, it doesn't even have the armor of a tank, right? Um, so it, it's, it's a tank, I, I guess, sort of, kind of. It's almost like a glorified sort of light assault gun in many ways, or just a, a swinging turret. It's, yeah. It's, 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 it's usefulness will be questionable, but I mean, they've got it on hand, so they might as well use it. Yeah. The French were trying to, uh, um, decommission these things. So of course it's going to end up in Ukraine. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right. Can you take us through the next one, Manjul? With the M113s. Yeah, sure. Sure. Okay, so obviously we've got the 90 M113s. Um, the United States has given... Uh, hold on, how much How much did we give? I have the number here, one sec. Um, oh, 300. We've given 300 M113s from U.S. stocks. That's not counting all of the other nation's contributions. Um, we've definitely seen the M113 in combat in Ukraine from the footage. Um, we see plenty of them getting blown up all over the place. 
it, the M113 has been around for a very, very long time. It, we, it was been used since Vietnam. Um, and the United States is trying to, like with everything else, all of this Cold War era kit is being shipped over there because it's an easy, easy way to reeve out your army. Right. I mean, they're going to have contracts to replace these things now. So this is sort of the military industrial complex spending. Yeah. Basically, R you're just going to retire and Lockheed Martin are, are licking their chops at the prospects of replacing this stuff. <laughs> oh, you know? oh, no doubt. No doubt. Yeah. Um, it, if I'll speak to the, the T-72, right, the Polish T-72s, um, they're the ones that Poland actually had after the fall of the Soviet Union are T-72Ms or T-72M1s. Um, qualitatively, they have slightly less armor than the usual uh, Soviet variant. Um, that I mean, obviously, most Soviet equipment outside of, of Russia proper is going to be like the export version. It has the same 125 millimeter gun. It just has less armor. Um, so qualitatively, it's not as good as, as the usual Russian T-72 B3, which is the standard version now. But they do um, have them and they have a lot. So this this one um, is not too bad. They're mechanized. Uh, they've got a good number of fairly modern tanks. They might be missing artillery. Is there a yellow line here? I can't even see. You know what? Yeah, there's I no, don't. Because there's it no looks corresponding like... flag to the right. It's just JPEG nonsense. Yeah. Yeah. So but the, there's, these there's guys actually obviously... seem to have everything. Oh, wait. No, wait. Yeah. There is a flag. There's a second Estonian flag over here. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. That's in the artillery uh, category, so that's probably uh, probably D thirties, another Soviet era gun that the the Estonians have given. Um, you can see M one hundred nines that we've given. That's that's our self propelled gun. I think in one hundred fifty five millimeter FH seventy we've already covered. Um, yeah. Okay, so what what is that? We have one, two. Well, also, just just the ice core to the. That the the Kiwis, the New Zealanders have dumped their excess M113s as well. Twenty on hand tend to appear. Oh, the the one seventeen brigade brigade. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> that, yeah that, that's like ninety percent of New Zealand artillery. They just dispatched. And what do we have here? Crap. Finland is that Finland? Yeah. Finland, yeah. That'd be um, the XA one eighty fives, I'd say, because there's a slash between them. Yeah. And then we're missing. Are we? We're missing more senators from Canada. PT ninety ones. What is that? That's artillery. That's no. That's a, that's a, a tank. P90. That is that is the okay. the Polish the Polish uh, post Soviet version of a T seventy two. Okay. Okay. So yeah. I'm assuming that I mean those must be fairly modern and um, mm -hmm. these yes. tanks. Yeah, they're not right. too bad. And they're missing some artillery. At least have twelve pieces. So not horrible. We're we're missing. Yeah, that's it's, AS90s. It's definitely missing a lot here. That's that's um, more of the British tank. Yeah, British artillery. Ninety strikers sorry. on eighty second. I don't know what a striker is. Uh, a striker is um, it's it's kind of an American response to um, uh, like a a BTR or the BMP two. It probably actually it's more the BMP two to be honest. BMP two, BMP three. Um, it's essentially a wheeled. Uh, Infantry APC with a twenty millimeter gun on top. Okay. And uh, martyrs. I'm assuming that's a similar type of vehicle. Um. Yeah. German. And then mm -hmm. we have the fourteen Challengers here from Great Britain. So there are those Challengers. Uh, only fourteen tanks in this brigade, I guess, because they have nice, fancy new Challengers. And normally they seem to mix like T sixty fours in, though, which is kind of weird. Um. I guess they didn't with the leopards. Um, I'm kind of assuming some of these were supposed to be M1 mm. Abrams, but uh, yeah. The other thing too is uh, one thing to keep in mind as well is that maybe since this this document was created or since it's been leaked or whatever, the British did did uh, elect to um, double their complement. Uh, they initially okay. announced that they were going to send 14 challenges, and now they now they're going to send 28. So. Maybe so, that's just not reflected in these numbers here, but that's just worth so, taking into account. Oh, that's that's a new piece of information for me. I didn't I didn't know that. Mm. Um, I do know, however, and this explains what where they're going to find the tanks, um, which is obviously I think uh, Germany, Denmark, and Norway are giving a hundred plus uh, Leopard One A fives, so they will find the tanks. 
if they need them. Um, okay, so we just looked at all the equipment they're supposed to have and gone over what's missing. As we've seen, a, a pretty good number of tanks are missing, and not all of these units are that well equipped. Um, there are a couple, maybe three of them were decently equipped, especially the mechanized units, but this isn't exactly a stellar fighting force. But if it could all be assembled, um, you know, it could definitely pack a punch. How many people are we talking about here? I mean, in a Ukrainian brigade, it might be like 4,000. So you could have as many as like 30,000 people maybe uh, in these brigades. That's a lot of men. Um, it's definitely doable. So this is a significant fighting force um, if assembled that could definitely have local numerical superiority wherever it's deployed. Um, but let's take a look at the training timeline. So we'll go down and look at the bottom real quick to get the legend. So we can see we have training window is like this beige color. Then we have an equipment transfer window. Um, and these colors correspond to which units are being trained. So we've got yellow for armor, green for mechanized, red for motorized, black for field, artil field artillery, and then anything outlined in red is at risk. So let's go back up to the top. Here's the start of the training window. You can see this first brigade starts at the very beginning of January. The training window opens. They, As of February 28th, they already trained some of the mechanized infantry here. Uh, the tank... The armor is about halfway completed its training. Uh, the artillery is mostly complete, and we have more artillery training coming up. Um, I don't see any issues here. Uh, they have everything scheduled, and they're moving along. Um, so on a good timeline. Uh, same for the second unit, where they're, they're on their timeline. Um, this third one as well. Um, they, seem, they had a transfer window over on the left, you can see, in blue, before they actually started their training. Um, as we get down to these now, you start to see issues. Um, so all these outlined in red are missing their training window so far um, and are at risk of not completing it. Uh, we can see these are battalion collectives, um, presumably multiple battalions being brought into the same place to be trained on their equipment. Um, so this box we're looking at sort of details um like the ongoing training on that line um so that's just sort of a summary of of the day i guess of the status of things um that day um we can see a lot of the motorized infantry are at risk actually um we have at the top a mechanized unit is at risk we have an artillery at the bottom here at the very bottom, we have more motorized units and artillery at risk. Um, so I think a better summary of this is actually what's over here on the right. <clears throat> we can look at the training percentages. Um, this is actually kind of confusing because it this gives the appearance that these training windows have passed, but this training is 0% complete. So I'm guessing, I'm not sure why these aren't highlighted in red. Like if we look all the way at the bottom, right, this challenger unit down here, that's what I'm looking at. Uh, these challengers that aren't like outlined in red, the February 28th line is right here, uh, but it says training 0% complete and also only 14% of equipment on hand. So I guess the training failed and didn't meet its timeline. Is that what your read of this would be? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I guess I'm not I'm not sure why these are at risk and why these other ones aren't if literally zero percent of the training is complete. Um, well, I mean, just like if you look at the timeline, right? Um, it, it says uh, okay, so so the answer is it says okay. Ah, limited challenger two ammo, pending yes. armor equipment delivery. So. I mean, where where you could see hangups, right, is um, in order to train, right, you have to be able to train people to know their job, right, and, and especially the officers have to know the job of what, what the unit they're leading is. So their mechanized units, their artillery has to know what they're doing, the armor has to know what they're doing. 
uh, then you have to integrate. And and if you want to get people to to be able to to fight and to be able to integrate, they have to understand how their systems work, especially when things don't go right. Um, and so, you know, that might where I see training hangups happening is probably at the 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 basic training phase, if you don't have ammunition to spare to give to training or at the integration phase when you're trying to put everything collectively together. Yeah. So this was just weird because it says that the pending armor equipment delivery. So I guess just the ammo is what they're waiting on. So yeah, this is confusing. All I can say is it says training is 0% complete. Um, And it says it for three of these and then two more. So five of the nine here are 0% trained. Um, That's obviously a problem. Um, This one's only 10% trained. This one's only 20% trained. This one's 40%. Only one of them is actually more than 50% trained, which is this very first one at 60%. Uh, So they're clearly behind on their training windows, probably due to missing deliveries. Uh, Because we can also see in a lot of these, you know, I'll just read from the top. Uh, short 17 tanks requires 122, 122 millimeter ammo, requires 122 millimeter ammo, pending leopards, pending armored motorized. Uh, short 20 tanks requires 122. Short 13 tanks, pending motorized delivery, requires 122 ammo. So lo- as you alluded to earlier, lots of 122 millimeter ammo missing. Uh, the AMX-10 is missing its ammo, pending armor and artillery delivery pending armored motorized delivery. So it sounds like they're missing a lot of the motorized units um, requires 122 millimeter ammo. Mm -hmm. And then at the bottom, limited challenger too. So ammo shortage, everyone has ammo shortages. Um, Yes. It's interesting, right? Um, And this is a development I I saw over this weekend. Uh, The Russians on their telegram channels are are, um, bragging about how they're going to get some kind of of an arms deal with uh, Egypt um, it's not for 122 millimeter tube ammunition. It's for the 122 millimeter rocket ammo for for grad launchers, and it's a small quantity. It's only for, like 40,000 rounds or something. But um, when you consider that the United States has has literally purchased uh, that same similar quantity of rounds in 122 millimeter rocket, 122 millimeter tube ammo, 152 millimeter artillery ammo 125 millimeter which is the the caliber for the the uh, t64 and t72 tanks um like we've literally gone and found this ammo someplace in the world and purchased it and given it to the ukrainians the u.s government literally did this in january um so the fact that russia is now catching on to um like an old Soviet style arms race, except now we're, we're purchasing aging ammunition from the third world to give and to make, or to prevent Ukraine from getting it is interesting, right? That seems to be something that's developing. Yeah. So yeah, I guess we can see everything on hand labeled. So, and I guess there's a corresponding amount over here. We can see the percent of equipment on hand on the right so the stuff in purple, um, which is most of it actually, is like scheduled and supposed to be there. So not everything is lost, but it's just not there yet. So they're missing a lot, which explains why like the stuff is still en route, basically. Um, as of February 28th, it might be there now. So yeah, they've missed just most most like the vast majority of the training has not been done because the equipment was not on hand as of the beginning of march who knows what the conditions are now uh you know six weeks later um into april we're now like halfway through april actually basically just today is when these blue windows should be closing um so these first six brigades up here should be transferring in the uh should be ready at the beginning of april and should be finish their transfer back to Ukraine in the middle of April in the spring offensive period. And then by the end of the month, these bottom three brigades will have transferred back to Ukraine. So basically this should all be wrapped up already. So what they've said is, as we said earlier, um, regardless of how well trained these are, they're going to be put into combat. 
So are they still going forward with that? I don't know. Um, it's strange yeah. to even imagine in this context, given how behind they are with only a month remaining. Uh, but there we are. Um, well, the, the final the final three um, units are going to be ready in two weeks' time, or supposed to be ready in two weeks' time. So we'll see how that goes. Um, right. And presumably then they'll have their nine brigades, and it'll be May. And May 1st, uh, or if we go back to... To weather slide. One, which one is it? This one. Um, yes. You can see it's not quite the first of May. It's like the second week of May it's projected uh, to be good at the blue line. But that, that the thing is, if they launch their offensive like well south of that blue line, which they very, very may well, and Zaporizhia, as many people have theorized, then they might already uh, be uh, able to launch it in like, well, not already, but definitely on the 1st of May, what will be plenty enough unfrozen uh, or favorable and not muddy rather. So basically this, this offensive is imminent if this timeline is, is stuck to. Yeah. Um, and, and so two things. Um, the first is that the offensive in, in, which is expected in Zaporizhia has long been telegraphed by the mainstream <coughs> press. Um, and it makes sense for why they would do that, right? The, the Ukrainians want to attack a, a a weak point in the line and to split the Russian forces um, so that, um, you know, you, you have a better tactical and operational situation. Um, the other thing to note here is um, with the um, uh, usage of tanks, um, the, there was a huge reason. And if, if everybody remembers a couple months ago, like there was a massive push to get Germany to give the Leopard 2 tank. Um, and there was a, there's a huge reason for that. Um, Germany specifically uh, stipulates in its export contracts um, that it basically the Germans want per, to want people to ask permission before they, you know, give weapons that Germany's exported to other countries. Right. Um so with all of the export contracts that Germany has with the Leopard 2, um, you can see, right, in the numbers, right, because Germany's only given, like, 14 Leopard 2s. Well, okay, Portugal has given three. Canada has given a couple. Um, uh, you know, Poland has given 14, right? Um, so you can, you can definitely tell that there's a reason why, because... Like, okay, you have 14 plus another 14 plus four. You're literally just doubling the amount of tanks, more than doubling uh, on this chart um, of Leopard 2s, right? So there's a reason why you saw this big grand push a couple months back to for, to get Germany to give the Leopard 2 to Ukraine. Um, and that's the reason. Right. Because as we see, every tank here is counting. I mean, they're down, uh, what is this, 40, 50 two tanks i think 53 something like that um which is like a fifth of their tank force that's expected is just missing um i guess too we can see in this column training the training column you can see what was completed um the only training i see completed is one in the u.s one in france and two in ukraine so yeah uh marcus do you have anything else to add here before we go look at another one um um, no, I think you, you guys have large, largely canvassed it. All I'll add just very briefly is that the more equipment a, a unit has, you know, from the standpoint of establishment is that it can actually train faster and the the men who are comprise the unit have greater familiarity, particularly in this case here where you have such a, a vast array of vehicles from a number of countries that have, you know, different, you know, firing systems that have different layouts. I mean, even within tanks, I mean, they're not uniform, you know, they're, their driving arrangements would be different from vehicle to vehicle. Um, even the, uh, you know, their, their firing mechanisms and their sights would be, have a different layout and, and whatever. And that brings about the other problem is that if, say, for instance, in the context of these, what, whichever these units might, you know, suffer more or less attrition than another unit, they need replacements who are then able to be uh, proficient in these vehicle types. Uh, you know, I'm speaking particularly in terms of, say, tanks and, you know, APCs and BMPs and that sort of stuff. Um, th that presents a huge problem for Ukraine and it presents a huge um, uh, 
deficiency for them that once these units are flung into battle and start suffering attrition, how capable of the replacements to use these vehicles? That's a, that's a big qu question that I would ask. I mean, we're, we're not there yet, but it's just a point for the future, of course. Right. I mean, these aren't exactly interoperable, are they? I mean, this equipment is all over the place. Um, exactly, yeah. I guess another thing, too, is remember there's three internally trained brigades and four internally formed brigades that aren't depicted here. So we have no idea what the status of that is, unless that's in some other paper I don't yeah. have. Uh, like, say, for example, um, Charlie, just because I can see it here, you got these 14 AMX 10s right in there. Is it 37 Brigade? You know, like, for example, yeah. they lose 10 of them, right? Mm -hmm. But let's just say the crew survive. Those men who have been trained in the AMX 10, you're not going to be able to throw them in a, in a Challenger tank, right? You know, the, they would actually have to then have, like, one or two challenges sort of back in Kiev somewhere or in Lviv somewhere and actually learn familiarity with the challenger before being redeployed to a new armored vehicle that they have no understanding of. I mean, these are the kind of things that, you know, when you, when one looks at just armies on paper, doesn't, isn't exactly apparent, but it's, it's a very much the case that this is a, um, as a, from a historical standpoint, the, um, the particularly the germans used to utilize something that they used to call beutepanzer which were like prize tanks and so the germans whenever they capture like t-34s or kv-1s or shermans in many cases as well would would you, know, you, you would utilize them and you know use them to sort of flesh out their own ranks but the germans actually had to take these tanks sort of behind lines and sort of learn familiarity with them and um i mean the germans did that because out of such, such industrial disadvantage they were forced to not utilize what captured equipment they could get their hands on but, I mean, this isn't achieved in a matter of weeks. It, it takes a relatively long time. And then if one crew is lost, then it has to be supplemented with a new crew who also have proficiency. And that's just a, a point that's not really discussed, uh, you know, in regards to this topic. Yeah. Um, the, the one other thing I'd like to mention on, on this uh, slide before we move on is um, just how much uh, strategic initiative it looks like like the U.S. has lost, just looking at what they don't have. Um, and th there's a general um, uh, misperception among the current leadership that technology um, and defeats uh, the enemy. And the answer is, well, no, technology is only as good as the people who are using it. In fact, the higher tech it is, the more highly trained personnel you, that you will need in order to operate that equipment, right? Um, if they don't know how to use the intricacies of a piece of uh, military hardware, they're, they're not going to be able to use it effectively at all, um, right? Your, your capability with the high tier equipment is only as good as, as the amount of training that the people who have been given the training. Um, and, you know, to a certain degree with motorized and mechanized infantry, they might not be so much the case you're you're just putting infantrymen in in an armored vehicle and, and sending them towards the enemy i guess but um there definitely appears to be a loss of strategic initiative for the united states and this whole putting together an armored brigade uh in order to to get some sort of armored offensive towards zaporizhia wherever it's going to go is something that um um, looks like they're desperately trying to get the initiative back into our corner. Um, I don't think that's going to happen just looking at, at this. It doesn't look like this is prepared at all. Um, it also shows uh, a lack of unity amongst uh, the NATO countries. Um, it's one thing to give aging M113s or M777 howitzers or, or D30s that are Soviet that you don't have much ammo for and they're just ancient anyway. Um, it's, it's quite another, it's also one thing to give your, your best, latest and greatest hardware because you want to op test it under suboptimal conditions in Ukraine. Um, but it's, it's quite another to start giving a lot of, of your like large numbers of, of the best hardware. Right. Um, and you're already starting to see some of the cracks forming, um, which most NATO countries are have been very reluctant to give aircraft with the exception of the post-Soviet ones. Um, and obviously France declined to give their uh, main battle tanks to Ukraine as well uh, in any significant numbers. So um, the, just to note how, how much they, they wanted to, 
to put together here and, and how much this is not happening at all. Exactly. Uh, to some degree, too, we've seen this even with um, a lot of light equipment, which was sent to Ukraine the first, you know, six months, year of the war, where sort of the Russians, you know, captured, you know, bundles of javelins and, um, you know, other kind of sort of indirect fire weapons and have basically reverse engineered them or even if they haven't built them they've at least been able to dissect them as to how they work and what their strong points and weak points are um another thing i'll I'll briefly add actually just as a broad judgment of this entire affair is that um see a lot of this equipment would have been better in the hands of we looked at that demographic graph earlier of that sort of 20 to 35 age bracket which is sort of generally the the uh the best sort of age group that should be sort of one's fighting force that should comprise the one's fighting force and see if the allies were actually serious about this i want to say the allies of nato were serious about this campaign from the onset this equipment they're sending now they should have sent you know maybe not 12 months ago but certainly eight nine months ago six months ago but instead there's been a lack of we might say political will or even sort of strategic sort of forward thinking that oh, well, what are the prospects, if we genuinely believe in this war, what are the prospects of, of success for Ukraine? And essentially, they would have gone all in from the beginning, but instead this stuff has gone in, in drips and drabs, drips and drabs. And I actually question now the ability of the Ukrainian army to train enough men who are capable of using this equipment. And indeed, if the, in the event that they do, my, my concern for them is then what kind of reserves do they have and their ability to sort of fight in a protracted sense with the, with this equipment, sort of, it just seems almost forlorn for them now. They're trying to build these brigades, you know, in the in the rear areas, as it were, and indeed they're being trained in other countries. But um, you know, sort of now, if you look at the amount of losses they've suffered, these units would have been infinitely more useful for the Ukrainian army six months ago, eight months ago. But here we are. Yeah, I think the issue is and is is that uh, Russia completely undercut. Uh, NATO strategy or the United States strategy by yeah, uh, seizing the strategic initiative and attacking preemptively. Uh, as, as much as it probably seems that the Russians were ill-prepared for it, which I think we can, we probably might agree on in varying degrees. In that sense, they did see strategic initiative. And I don't think, um, I don't think NATO has been able to ever recover from that personally. I mean, we've seen what the Ukrainian military could do against the um, Luhansk um, People's Militia effectively uh, during that offensive in Kharkov, right? Um, so if you know Russia had not invaded, we possibly would have seen that attack play out maybe in 2022, maybe this year. But either way, that's appears to be what NATO was aiming for, was to just mm. um, sweep in after this long military buildup Ukraine has been doing um and you know take back those two uh republics or even just the portions of those republics but now uh you yeah. have the russian professional military stuff in there with all of their mm. equipment um mm. and y- yeah it just appears that uh america can't take the initiative back uh yeah and the nato uh, alliance is mm. not sufficient either exactly and, and we touched on this both when you and i have spoken with aa on the last two streams we've covered this on uo and i think we might have discussed this last time we discussed this on your channel previously charlie is that um you know there's a that is the definitive difference between the the levels of conscription that ukraine has implemented and the fact that russia has engaged in one round of partial mobilization that and also you got to think in terms of the russian mobilization we 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 are still now essentially don't know to what degree those forces have been deployed and that that um that uh, mobilization was announced was it last september if i'm not mistaken or october and those men have just been quietly in training, remobilizing, refitting in Russia. And we still don't really know to what degree they have or haven't been deployed because there'd be very there'd be varying degrees of readiness of those reserves that were mobilized. So probably where Russia had to plug gaps, they probably plug gaps at the moment. But they chan- chances are they still actually have units that are in training and are being retrofitted now. And those men have, because they're already, you know, members of the armed forces, they already have experience with their vehicles i already have experiences you know with the t60 uh, t64s and t72s and t80s and t90s and stuff and you know and, and the bmp vehicles they don't need to learn new familiarity and the russians are spending longer to train them so this is the difference in philosophy between the two countries but i suppose in russia's context they have the um 
the liberty of doing it this way where's ukraine within in, in two ways. One, they have this internal pressure, you know, of the Zelensky government of needing to do something and feeling compelled to uh, maintain Western favour. And then from the West, from a sort of a grand strategic perspective, is they feel that Ukraine has this narrow window of opportunity and they have to strike and they're piling pressure on Kiev to, you know, to, to do this. And so it's kind of the, the worst sense of, you know, the, the Ukrainian side is being is rushing themselves because they feel like they need to rush, but then they're being forced to rush by their NATO allies, whereas the Russians are sort of taking their time. And this is the uh, a major distinction between the two forces at play. Yes. Um, well, getting into that, I think this map in particular is illustrative. This is, of course, uh, Kherson and Zaporizhia, where many have theorized that the offensive uh, is going to take place, specifically over here uh, in this area. Um, I guess before we get into that, what does it say? Top secret, a bunch of other markings. Also, no foreign, so no foreign eyes on this. Um, so we're expecting Ukraine to attack here. At least that's kind of what's been telegraphed. We can see that there's three brigades here. Um, we've got infantry, mechanized infantry, armor. Are those the three brigades Ukraine is supposed to supply, or are they building mm -hmm. new brigades for this offensive? I'm not sure. Um, well, they've already got another mechanized infantry up by Volodar, yeah. at least on this map. Yeah. Um, so maybe, maybe. And um, if we look down here, this is really interesting. So what are the total personnel deployed here, according to these estimates? is actually really low. Um, there's a surprisingly small number of forces deployed um, in this war on both sides thus far. That's particularly interesting on the Russian side. If we look here, Russia has 83 total battalions here. 13 of them are territorial defense battalions. That's going to be like the militias from Donetsk and Luhansk, um, or even Zaporizhia now, I, I assume, has uh, has its own like defense force. So those are just going to be local forces. We also have 39 uh, Russia-led battalions. That's interesting because... The Russia-led battalions are going to be like the Chechens and Fogder, and basically they're imperial forces. Um, whereas we can see that they're maneuver battalions, they actually are deploying fewer of those than these Russia-led forces and territorial defense units. So what this tells us is that they're really holding back their regular military. And in fact, we can see in Kherson, um, lar it's large number of territorial defense battalions. Um some Russian-led forces, and then, you know, less than half of the personnel in the Kherson Axis is going to be their professional military. So uh, while Ukraine's uh, forces are being spent, Russia is really holding back these professional forces that's been mobilizing, uh, to uh, Marcus Furious's point. Um, anyone want to add anything there? Uh, I think Furious went to go grab coffee, um, but I can speak on this. Um, yeah, this is a very interesting um, slide as well. And we'll see this. There's a pattern here that we'll see in the rest of the slides as well, which is in every single axis that they have listed here, the Russians always have, with maybe one or two exceptions, um, superiority in numbers uh, in local superiority of numbers specifically in every single place on these slides, right? Zaporizhia, right? You can see this is from, you know, DOD estimates. Um, this is 23,000. Ukrainians at, on the high end are said to have 8,000 people. Um, and the Russians in Kherson, that's 15,000 to 2,500 for those who were just listening and aren't watching. Um, so the Russians have like, you know, four or five times the amount of people. Um, and the same pattern is, is you can see in, in the rest of the areas too. Russia always has it has a local um, superiority in numbers, even if it's a small one. They they still have more guys in in the local area. So it's it's interesting to see um, because typically the narrative that we all have thought of throughout this war has that been that Russia has had very small. Uh, amounts of forces in this country, and they invaded with a relatively small force of 100, 150,000, maybe 200,000 on the high end. And uh, the Ukrainians have essentially, you know, used, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. They've been at full mobilization of the country for an entire year now. So you would, the, the narrative that we were seeing 
was that Ukraine had essentially mobilized its entire populace to fight this war. And with the numbers that we see on these axes, I'm not seeing it. I don't, I don't see a mass mobilization of, of Ukrainian manhood to fight this conflict at all. And maybe this is going back to our demographics problem that Ukraine has. Um, but that's just interesting. Um, it just, it looks to me like you just don't have the manpower. Yeah, well, we have to keep in mind, too, I mean, a lot of these people have left the country, but you also can't just send your entire population to war, right? I mean, because, you know, we talk about this with the American military, like you need like 10 support staff for one soldier. I mean, you still need people working in your regular industries or even the war industries, right? So not every citizen is even eligible um, to be a soldier or else your military is going to fall apart. Um so that's another interesting angle on that. But let, let's go back to this slide. So, you know, remarkably few people deployed in Kherson, but of course it makes sense because of the Dnieper River. And we know Russia just evacuated this area. Um, if they do actually, let's say the 12 brigades are about 4,000 men each at full strength, that's going to give us with 48,000 men. If 48,000 men uh, attack here in Zaporizhia, that would be a two to one superior superiority in all of Zaporizhia and probably more like four to one uh, locally. So it would certainly be enough to attack with. If this combat force can be assembled and if it's trained and is equipped, it does constitute a viable offensive force. Um, does that mean it can penetrate all the way to Melitopol or something like that? Probably not. Um, but it's definitely nothing to write off. Um, but so far, all we know about it is what exists on paper as of a month ago. Um, should we look at the map, just this area a little more, um, in terms of like where they might attack and why? Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, so, basically, the idea here is the, these dotted lines are like the roads, right? And you can see thinner roads. There are there are actually not very many roads. Um, in this area. My understanding from watching Jimmy Thomas videos is you basically want two parallel roads on your axis of advance, um, which is already problematic in this area. Um, but if you look between these roads, there aren't really like back roads or smaller roads other than these highways that actually go in the direction you want for any significant distance. Um, this front also from north to south, it's it's like a hundred kilometers or, or is it a hundred miles? Let's see. What is a Let's see. Melitopol to Kherson is 200, 123 kilometers. So it's probably like 50 kilometers, maybe north to south. So a bit of an overestimate, I would say. So, I mean, their strategy would basically be uh, they have to take Tokmak in order to get to Melitopol. Um, if they wanted to go to uh, Berdyansk, they would need to actually do that to take Melitopol. Um, because the Russians can supply Melitopol from Berdyansk if the Ukrainians don't penetrate all the way to the Sea of Azov down here. So this is a pretty big deal because from what we've seen, I mean, Ukraine really needs to go for some sort of knockout blow here or else the Russians are just going to overwhelm them. Uh, originally, I thought time favored um, the Ukrainians, but given that Russia has survived the sanctions and even thrived, uh, I think it's pretty clear that that time is on the side of Russia in this fight. Uh, presumably, assuming there's no other like major changes in like you know world relations or anything like that. Um, the, yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say. Sorry, I, I just got back from I, I, I resupplied my coffee. Um, so sorry, I was gone for a couple of minutes. But the other thing too is to consider about offensive offensives and sort of spearheads is that uh, it's only so powerful as this is. is has its ability to protect its flanks. And right. I don't see the ability of the Ukrainians to actually spread out that spearhead across a wide frontage and actually defend what one might call the shoulders of the spearhead, which is, you know, if, if one looks, say, for example, the quintessential example of this is the Battle of the Bulge, um, where the Germans sort of flung the last reserves on the Western Front to try and capture Antwerp in, you know, the, the dead of winter of 1944. And... It was an ambitious plan anyway, and although it got off to a pretty promising start, it was completely undermined by the fact that, you know, Patton turned his armoured, his fourth armoured up northwards 
um towards towards Bastonia and then completely smashed into the to the flank of um of the of the German panzer units pushing westwards and what the what the Russians could do is even though <laughs> to, to use um to use an uh, an AA ism uh, General Grug, um, Mr. Uh, you know General Surovikin, who's been in charge of this part of the front ever since um, Gerasimov has been installed above him as a theater commander. Um, they, sh uh, they have been once they pulled back from Kherson, you know, a couple months back. They have just been fortifying these lines, and there's actually vi video ev evidence now. I think Thirty Mapping actually did something a couple of weeks back. Yeah, they're they're oh, satellite yeah. imagery of this area. Yeah. So they're the Russians have going from. Um, mm. Well, basically, the, the uh, from from the, the Dnieper, Dnieper River yeah. by Veselika yeah. all the way yeah. to Polohoy and further, they have two mm. fortified lines of defense, and then mm -hmm. their third line of defense is rings around each of these cities. Mm. So the Russians exactly. have been fortifying this area with fixed yeah. fortifications to defend yeah. against the obvious offensive. Mm. Why? Why would the offensive be here? It's because it would split the Russian front in half and could yeah. potentially be lethal to everything. And over here yeah. in the west and breaks the land bridge the, the exactly. land bridge of crimea but the, but the, the point i was going to like make you said, was the flanks though um yeah so so the point i was going to make was that if the, if the russians actually found a particularly tough going and they couldn't palm off the offensive directly speaking through their fortifications which is entirely probability what the what i, I would have presumed the russians would then do is sort of would um concentrate their own armored reserves on either side of a of a proverbial spearhead and then sort of once the Ukrainians are, have reached a specific depth or have overstretched their supply lines ever so much, they would then sort of counterattack and basically do, you know, a, a reverse Stalingrad, a reverse Third Battle of Kharkov on them, which is, you know, it is basically, um, you know, armoured warfare theory 101 is the ability to cut off a speedhead of an, of an opposing um, attacking force. And so... You know, it's one of those situations where the Ukrainians could actually sort of like advance themselves into their own doom in some ways. All right, so that's what would happen here. Like, let's say they penetrated all the way to Berdyansk. It's like, how would they actually defend this 50 kilometer flank? It would look like the attack on uh, Kiev, right? I mean, the Ukrainians, sure, they can break through the Russian positions, but how are they actually going to support those flanks, even if they did succeed in cutting the lines mm. in half? Um, yeah, exactly. One thing we should note, too, these gray units right here. These are Russian units uh, accessed as combat ineffective. So this sort of gap in the Russian line uh, by Velkia, Novosilka, and Polohi is kind of the obvious place for the Ukrainians to attack based on this current intelligence, unless things have changed in that area. And, we uh, see and just by looking here. at the... I was going to say, just looking at the symbols too, it appears that that's where some of their naval infantry is located because you can see the anchor on the, on yes. the diamond there. Um, the other thing is no, too is that you know, experience again from what I've you know read from history is that uh, so-called combat ineffective divisions are the kind of the uh, divi oh, well, not divisions in this case, but these are sort of br brigades and battalions. But then they're the kind that you can't really send onto onto the offense because they'll just weaken them further. But they can be used as static defense units, and they, if they're relatively well fortified and they're supported with you know indirect fire support, or you know, they have you know um, armored elements within their proximity, they can actually hold you know, to a point against even a relatively strong offensive. So you'd imagine that either this is done by intention because they might be expecting this armored push or that um, because of the fact that these units are somewhat combat ineff ineffectual or certainly uh, uh, ineffectual in, on the offense, that the, the, the Russians are resorting to the fact that, okay, these units are weak, weakened from combat. Let's dig them in and let's create as much fortified strength as we're able to and whenever the Ukraine, the Ukrainian army does initiate their offensive, then then the best possible position to rebuff that offensive. That I'm just presuming that's what the Russians might be thinking. Right, and we can see too. We know they've been attacking around Orkiv and Uglodar, and we can see that's where their combat effective units are deployed. Uh, one thing too is, I mean, I, I just don't have confidence on this on paper offensive to actually succeed, given what we've seen around Bakhmut, right with the roughly 80,000 men deployed there. I mean, how how is like 50,000 or so men going to, you know, take more? I mean, the Ukrainians have not taken back any city in this entire war um, in a protracted siege, like around uh, Severodonetsk or Bakhmut. Mm. Like, is their army yeah. even capable of doing that? Because they're going to have to sit 
at the they've only taken ground months. where the Russians have relinquished, essentially. Right. Where, 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 um, where the Russians have either sidestepped or tactically withdrawn is where Ukraine has advanced. There has not been, um, I mean, for instance, like, you know, on the outskirts of Kiev, right? And, and we can say, we can sort of, um, you know, we, we, we can um, speculate whether that was an intended offensive or, or not, or whether the Russians attempted to take it or not. That's neither here nor there. The point is that the Ukrainians, where they have established defensive lines and have fought and have fought gallantly, they have managed to blunt Russian attacks in certain places, be it Kiev, be it, you know, the the initial part of um, the, the Lysychansk, Severodonetsk offensive, um, where there was actually the fact that the Ukrainians did successfully rebuff the Russians from capturing uh, Mikolaev quite early in the war and all the subsequent attempts to take Mikolaev. They're just examples that I'm sort of citing. They have stopped the Russians in certain places. But never have they been able to actually take Russian positions at the, where the Russians have dug in and held the line and committed to a solid defense. It's only been where the Russians have either sidestepped or tactically withdrawn where Ukraine has taken positions um, on that basis. Right. And if this offensive was supported by another like uh, amphibious assault across the Dnieper River, that would be one thing. But that's not going to happen. So at the very least, they have to take Melitopol. Talking about both of these, I'll just get surrounded and uh, cut off, and mm-hmm. the, the Russians will be able to supply their troops. But not to mention, I mean, this offensive is going to take place basically in Russian airspace. So the Russian air force is going to be able to operate a lot more openly than the basically non-existent Ukrainian air force. So this mm. offensive is not. I, I can't see how it could be supported. Uh, like in this region in the ways that we mm. need to be to actually succeed well what's worse too i mean there's there's been evidence from the documents here and then there's actually been testimony from some people who, who've spoken to you know independent journalists shall i say and the fact that the ukrainians are running extremely extremely low on their air defense capabilities in terms of their surface uh, surface to air missiles etc so the thing is that not only will there be a lack of ukrainian air force to in fact assist or indeed protect any proverbial offensive or spearhead that they might successfully initiate in this sector but then moreover if and when the the russians pile their own you know army aviation to interdict the ukrainian offensive itself um the ukrainians will have very little instead uh, uh, with the exception of their sort of handheld you know man pads and and whatever there's no real technical um systems which will be able to deter the Russian Air Force from, you know, committing itself to battle and, you know, blunting this from the air as well as from the ground. There's that consideration as well. Yeah, that's an important consideration too. Um, one of the major questions of this war so far has been the uh, lack of the Russian Air Force. And one of the reasons uh, which we are about to get into of why that is, is because the Ukrainians still um, have been given lots of, of air support and uh, at least air defense um, in the form of Stinger missiles, but they've also been given more sophisticated systems as well. Um, and from the Russian perspective, um, why would you spend the life of a, of a trained pilot, which obviously it takes like the U.S. military about two years to train up a, a pilot um, in, through flight school? Um, so why would you... St- spend the life of a pilot it took you years to train plus a multi-million dollar aircraft um when mm-hmm. you can just use a drone which costs you no lives and you know significantly less in terms of the cost of rubles to to purchase yeah, yeah. And, and rather than say like a, a handful of glided bombs on a particular target you can saturate that area with you know 200 artillery shells well you know i mean there's advantages <laughs> to using the glider bombs or you know to using air to surface missiles and that sort of thing you know in terms of a a pilot that has the ability to to aim properly and isn't being harassed by air defense or by um you know hostile aircraft can target a position with probably more proficiency more accuracy but at the risk of not exposing a pilot and a plane like you say both of which are expensive and time consuming in terms of production and training there are alternatives that are cheaper and, and the russians have been doing that up to this point so to the extent we're now, and I mean, many people have been saying this, it's it's true in these documents, it's true in Western commentary, it's even true in, you know, 
independent journalism and from the Russian side is that the Ukrainians are running out of, you know, missiles for their, you know, their S, S, uh, you know, the anti-air systems, S three hundreds and more, and even the, the few kind of systems that the Germans and the Americans have been sending them. They just don't have enough ammunition to run them you know at full tilt in fact they're having to be very sparing with what ammunition they have left so that's basically giving this window of opportunity for russian aviation to sort of you know make itself to to, to bring to to bring to to bring to bear its power on the battlefield which it hasn't done to this point yeah and you're def definitely starting to see um the russian air force uh on the move um mostly it's been attacks um uh, in i think orlivka um, places in Zaporizhia that are relatively close to the front line, um, do mm. basically just, they're just doing clump that close air support or combat air support. Um, but you're going to see an increase in that once, once the Ukrainians run out of ammunition. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Uh, which is more or less what we're looking at now. Um, this is a little harder to read, but this is basically their air defense missiles. Um, in summary, it's the chart of we're running out of everything. Um, the red area, the dark red rather, is where they're actually going to run out of these various different types of missiles. Um, these are all, I think, older Soviet systems, SA-3. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then it looks yep. like towards the bottom we have the more modern, here's the Patriot system actually I see, um, and other American systems, which they have more of. So basically, I mean, they're, they're running out of their old Soviet stock, and they're basically going to be entirely dependent on um, the West and especially the United States for their missile defenses. And of course, this is why Russia is not deploying their air force in full uh, because why do that? And when you can just wait until they slowly exhaust themselves, um, taking shots at what you are deploying. Right. I mean, uh, we we're seeing similar, we're seeing similar through lines with both how Russia is using their air force and their army in terms of being very, very protective of their high tech stuff. Um, you know, they're deploying their T-55s now, which people laugh at. I mean, we see Ukraines using T-55s too, but obviously use that stuff and save your biggest punch until the end, right? I mean, this is what you want. I mean, you can think of any number of examples of this, like, in history. I don't know, like, look at the, like, Kaiserschlacht or something and, and see how that turned out. Um, you always want to preserve your most elite units uh, because when you lose them, they're gone. Uh, sort of like the stormtroopers, right? Like, once you use them, they're gone. And... You, you no longer have the capability to deliver that big punch. Um, yeah, if, if I may jump in here. Um, th there's an interesting um, flow to conflicts uh, that I've noticed in my own readings. Um, I, I constantly reference uh, um, um, the, the book 100 Days of War by Admiral Sandy Woodward. Um, there's an interesting uh, observation I made in that book, which is... Um, the there's a flow to to combat right you start out the combat with um some of your big hardest hitting assets you know you want to penetrate your enemy's defenses and and you know you use for example the argentinians use one or two exocet missiles um but then as the conflict grinds on then you transition to you know what i what i derisively call the garbage pail like you re you get rid of all of your lowest tier assets and make your enemy a try all of their ammunition and what you're really hoping to do by that is um you're trying to have them lose uh one arena of warfare right okay i want them to either lose air defense or i want them to lose aircraft and, and not have an effective air force i want them to to no longer have tanks even if they have armored vehicles i want them to you get the, the the picture, right? You want to make sure that whatever asset that my enemy loses first, um, then you can exploit the fact that they're, now they have it, what's called a capabilities gap, right? Um, so uh, that's basically what Russia is doing right now. And, and once they've come, you know, sufficiently attracted the Ukrainians, that's when I would expect that they'd send in, um, you know, a more finishing blow and actually use some of the high high tier stuff again. Right, and we've also, uh, I mean, looking at this, so the, the the pinkish color, I guess, the salmon color, we'll say, is operational missiles. So we can see around the sp the time of the spring offensive, um, let's say the beginning of May, 
is sort of a critical period because the blue windows are the delivery and training timelines. So around April, they are going to be out of a lot of their old Soviet stock. They'll still have some of it, as we can see. Uh, but the American stock for a lot of these systems, like the Patriot missiles, uh, won't have come in yet. Um, and, and indeed, some won't even come until the end of May. So that's going to be a very vulnerable area. We can also see the Russian strikes, strike waves that are pretty periodic, denoted as these little like diamonds up here. So that's when the Russians are, are hitting Ukraine with their big missile strikes and whatnot. Because some of these are these surface to air missiles some are going to be used to shoot down fighters some are going to be used to shoot down other missiles right and this sort of thing so that's all on this slide i don't know which is which i don't know enough about missiles um but uh yeah we can we can see they're definitely still going to have a number of things operational even at the end of may so they're not out of missiles um by any means but they are running out and this old soviet stuff in particular i mean i guess once they're out, they're out. Like, where are they going to get more old uh, Soviet missiles from? Like, uh, I don't know how many factories they which, have produced that yeah. stuff. Which indeed brings brings about the question, too, because we, we've hardly touched on this. And, and to be honest, I, I, Charlie, we've actually hardly even mentioned it ourselves in the discussions we've had is to, to what degree that Ukrainian industry is still functioning? Because we've sort of seen what, like, GDP contractions of something in the order of, like, 30% thereabouts, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. But um, to what degree are they able and are they still making their own munitions, their own, um, you know, defense systems and, you know, weaponry, this sort of stuff? Um, I, again, I don't know the answer to that. I'm just sort of positing a question here. But their, their ability to make the kind of things that they need domestically, you know, it, it ought to be brought into question because, like you say, they, they do have reserves or at least, you know, they have some reserves of this Soviet era technology or indeed slightly post-Soviet technology, which are of a domestic nature, but to what degree are they able to actually supply those? That's also good because, I mean, uh, what we've sort of seen is an increasing dependence and a, and a reliance on both NATO equipment and the NATO um, sort of quote-unquote allies being able to supply those weapons because Ukraine obviously themselves don't have the ability to um, produce the munitions for these weapon systems that NATO is providing. So that's another question worth uh, you know asking ourselves. Um, so we can see here on this other page related to this that uh, it talks about how by May 23rd, their ability to provide medium range air defense to protect the FLOT. Um, I'm not sure what that acronym stands for. Uh, will be completely reduced by May 23rd. Uh, I'm guessing that FLOT is some sort of acronym for, like, the entire theater uh, of the conflict. Um, they are assessed to withstand two to three more wave strikes, which Russia does every couple of weeks. As first layer defense munitions run out, second and third layer expenditure rates will increase, um, reducing the ability to defend. Uh, courses of action in blue is basically, like, reduce the number of things you fire at. Uh, the assessment over on the left is, um, let's see, the SA-10 and SA-11 missiles, the Soviet ones, compromise 89% of their medium and high range defense. Um, in the risks, the basically the Russian, uh, Russia is just going to gain increased air superiority in Ukraine as um, Ukraine runs out of missiles. That's all this is really saying here. Um, we also have this chart picked out in particular um as like a separate screenshot but yeah do you guys have anything else to add here i don't feel a need to go into detail on this sure go ahead i, I have one last thing um so the the question also is one of timing, right? Um, so if Ukraine is going to run out of its its air defenses or a lot of its air Soviet era air defenses right around now um and definitely towards the the early part of may right um, that's the same time when they're planning the spring offensive, right? So you're telling me that, you know, you know, a month, two weeks into a spring offensive, you are out of Iris T of NASAMs. Like that's, that's not Soviet. Those are both Western systems, right? So you're telling me that not only are you out of Soviet equipment, you're out of, out of some of the Western stuff that's, that's been provided to you. Um, that's not good. Um, and 
you know, I'm just thinking of, of scenarios uh, of what happens to armor caught on the open road uh, with an enemy who has air superiority or even air supremacy. Um, what's going to happen then when you only have, you know, javelins and shoulder mounted things that you can use? Um, yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, the Russians in that case, why would I, why would I not just use my SU-25 Frogfoot and it's basically their version of a Warthog, right? The Soviet Warthog with, you know, you know, not even smart munitions, not even glide munitions, just send them in and bomb them from the air with, you know, dumb bombs. Right. And that's, we, we know easy. that the, uh, Ukrainians have been having trouble with these guided bombs that Russia is, uh, sending in, um, and that makes sense given their inability to intercept these things. I'm a guess. I'm guessing it's more difficult to intercept the guided bomb as well, as it won't have the same signature as like a missile or something, which should be more easily targeted. Um, I don't know if either of you know about these systems, but uh, that's just a guess on my part. We can also see on number four here on under assessments, limited or no Ukrainian air to air defense. So basically, uh, so much for Ghost of uh, Kiev, the Ukrainians cannot engage in air to air combat. Uh, well, that is problem. that is why uh, you see MiG 29s being given to Ukraine now. Um, that's that's a recent development. But I mean, again, where are you going to find the pilots? Yeah, I mean, this, these air defense slides are basically saying uh, Ukraine is just uh, like they're running on empty at this point in terms of what they have here. Uh, I think we're we're going to start seeing the impact of that in June, especially because. Unless the U.S. and NATO allies can really start getting these systems in there, which maybe they will, you know, uh, all we have here is till the end of May. Uh, some of these schedules should be completed within May, so they might be able to uh, resurrect the Ukrainian air defenses, or at least keep it at the same level it is now. Um, this is only saying that the based on the current like rates of expenditure and plan, unless we figure out something else, some other way to get them more weapons, they're going to run out. Um, so definitely pay attention to news on this. Uh, anyone want to add anything else about air defenses? Um, the only thing I will say, um, sorry, sorry, Madra, I don't know if you're just going to talk then, but um, just that generally in these sort of situations, because, uh, you know, we're, I suppose, again, World War II is one of our best sort of, proximal examples close enough to modern history where there's been widespread conventional warfare to make this comparison viable is that as the capacity for air defense and by that i mean sort of surface to air technology you know obviously the germans had flak in world war ii in the modern day we have air to surface missiles sand batteries that sort of thing uh, and also you know active air defense in terms of pitching one's air force against another in both a defensive or an offensive posture um as things become more precarious for ukraine they're probably more inclined to draw their defenses closer to say kiev and to their main um well on one hand their main uh areas of uh, you know in terms of military bases barracks deployment that sort of thing and their military infrastructure so you'll actually find rather than having these missile systems sort of near the periphery near the front actually protect the front line as a way they'll sort of concentrate these defenses closer to kiev closer to lviv closer to you know Dnieper, Dnieper and uh, Zaporozhye like the actual cities per se uh possibly to even protect even by like, the Kurdasan the bridgehead to stop the Russians you know going back over the um the Dnieper and so far that they can stop that if if and when that arises uh and same thing with the jets as well whether they commit jets to protecting the speedhead like I was talking about before we're yet to find out I guess we'll know about that when it happens uh, but indeed, to what degree they have trained pilots, and, and if in the event they get NATO-supplied aircraft, you know, jets and whatever, you know, again, we don't even know that either. But whatever, whatever limited degree that they have an air force, it will be concentrated around the defense of their capital and their major uh, cities. And then again, given its, its numbers, given how small the Ukrainian air force is and how few pilots they have, um, would they be actively using them? So as things diminish from that standpoint, you'll see this... Uh, concentration of of the, the few remaining assets which exist will come closer to kiev closer to their main centers of command and control and um you know training etc you know major ma major uh, military assets as it were we can also note that a lot of this stuff is uh in yellow uh so remembering our color code um a lot of it's promised but 
we don't actually have a delivery schedule for most of the things here that have been promised. So that's interesting as well. I mean, this is really critical because if Ukraine cannot actually effectively defend from the air in any sense, Russia is going to just start steamrolling uh, their armored units um, through airstrikes. Uh, I mean, you can't you can't lose control. Uh, they don't they don't need to have fighter jets in the air, but they can't lose control of air defense completely. Or there's simply no way they can come back from this. So this is a serious problem, um, and it looks like Ukraine is going to be entirely dependent on the West for its air defenses. So, all right, let's uh, go look at something else. Let's see, we've seen that slide. Um, I haven't even looked at this one, but this is Kharkov. We can look at the personnel. The Kharkov axis has a lot of people in it on the Russian side. Um, we can imagine why, uh, because of the previous uh, offensive there. Um, we can see they have a lot of their professional military deployed here, which lines up with what happened here earlier in the year, because we know that, you know, all the Ukrainians were on by supporting these territorial battalions, which is the Luhansk militia, um, with their professional units. Um, also explains why so many are combat ineffective, because the fighting here would have been pretty intense. Um, I don't really have anything else to say here other than that basic analysis, other than like Ukraine is uh, pretty badly outnumbered here. Um, I, I dare say, to... just on this point, if Ukraine calls off this impending offensive, which for the sake of human life, I actually hope they do because I, I, I dare say there's a very, very strong sense of lawn foreboding that I feel if they just throw their men into, into this meat grinder, um, which, you know, Ukraine has demonstrated its capacity to do uh, previously. You know, even though, for example, we mentioned that the Russians did sort of sidestep withdraw from Kharkov Oblast, um, they were still shooting the Ukrainians whilst they were withdrawing, and the Ukrainians did suffer losses, as we know, even though they retook places such as Izium and, you know, Kupiansk and Liman, etc. Um, but this here, I dare say, these soldiers that Russia has deployed um, on this, basically what is the border of the Luhansk Oblast and uh, the Kharkov Oblast, is mm -hmm. a deterrent insofar that if Ukraine does send its soldiers south against Zaporozhye, well, this would just be like the, the swinging door that would likely hit the Ukrainians in the arse, um, as it were, um, because there's no way that they could mobilize the kind of strength that they need for an offensive push that has a prospect of taking Russian territory and brushing aside Russian forces. Whilst holding the line here in Kharkov, I can't see them doing both at once. It just seems um, unfeasible. Yeah, this this is this battle was interesting too. If you look at the battle uh, of Kharkov, the way the what Russians withdrew, they they withdrew from smaller and smaller pockets until they had a consolidated defense line that at no point was at risk of being encircled, um, which just sort of plays into the theme like the Russians have been very conservative with their forces. They've avoided even minor encirclements and mass surrenders of forces um, wherever they've could, always sacrificing land to preserve their army. Um, so, I mean, I think we, we've seen a lot of... Which has been the inverse of Ukraine, right, Charlie? I mean... <laughs> Ukraine has dug in wherever they've found themselves and only withdrawn at the very last moment, say, for example, Lizichansk and Severodonetsk. They, they literally had to send the, the Kraken special forces in to retrieve men in the city, you know, right at the last gasp. They've dug in everywhere else and just kept fighting despite the odds. And uh, here we have Bakhmut as of the 1st of March. Um, we can see the numbers roughly correspond to... What I understand, it's like 60,000 or so Russians, and maybe this is out of date, or maybe it's excluding like rear echelon, but I'm pretty sure the Ukrainians have like 80,000 men in this area now. But I know they've moved a lot of other, they've moved a lot of brigades over here too, so maybe at this mm. point, uh, they mm, really I, did only have like yeah. 30,000 men or so. Which I say, would you agree, because I think we touched on this before, is probably what... Um, dissuaded the russians from actually attempting an actual a tangible encirclement of bakhmut is the fact that they deployed particularly initially you know when the russians were pushing for ivanivska initially um you saw that the ukrainians sort of sent a, a whole bunch of their sort of combat forces on that southern flank to stop that southern pincer creeping upwards and taking the highway 
um and because they've protected as i've referenced before like the shoulder of of their of their front uh the russians have just been quite content to just you might say operationally surround Bakhmut with artillery and not actually attempt to close the pincer Oh, yeah. I mean, to Ukraine's credit, I mean, they stopped that encirclement in its tracks. Uh, Russia was going for the encirclement, but they were able to maneuver forces into place to where that couldn't happen. I mean, Russia would definitely actually encircle the city if they could, but they've instead been content to just fight their way through it, which they've done instead. Um, this is interesting because I guess I'll pull up a current situation map uh, in Bakhmut, but this front, Russia has, well, Ukraine has talked about a. Um, unblocking maneuver quote unquote um in this area of the war i don't really know how they would do that unless the spring counteroffensive was in this region in which case they could uh actually threaten to do that i mean i guess their forces in being here uh, aside from the offensive definitely have uh, the capabilities to do so now, because like I said, this is out of date. I think there's like 20,000 men just up around Seversk itself, if I remember correctly. Um, it's hard for me to imagine how they would succeed in unblocking Bakhmut just with those forces, uh, given how much Russia has deployed here. Uh, but yeah, this this is another potential front where we could see this offensive launch. And maybe they divert it here, given you know the telegraphing of it in Zaporizhia. I mean, what's weird about this whole war is how much everything is like telegraphed, like we're watching a movie or something. Like why, I don't really understand why the concept of attacking Zaporizhia has been talked about so much, unless uh, it's just like a diversion. I don't know. Um, it, it almost seems like that could be the only explanation, right? You know, again, I sort of like what I mentioned before about Kursk and how sort of the, the Soviets knew the Germans were coming for months. They just there's absolutely no sense in telegraphing your one's you know offensive movements in war. It literally just condemns your own troops to just being massacred against layers and layers of entrenched defenses and you know um, literal planned um, defensive networks. It just it, it it just boggles the mind. And again, um, one of the things that comes to mind is that the the Russians seem to be fighting a a war in a country context with aspects of PR controlled domestically, whereas Kiev and the Kiev regime and the West seem to be motivated in fighting the PR war primarily with the material aspect of all being a second secondary consideration. And that there's these the, the the necessity to sort of propel narrative is trumping uh, operational and strategic sensibility and just this whole this whole subject, this whole notion of pushing this offensive that seems to be necessary at, at any at any cost. Meanwhile, they keep telegraphing the one or two locations where it's probable. It, it just it does it. The only the only way I can phrase it is that it boggles the mind. It genuinely does. Which is yeah, why, so I I like I said, from a human context, I hope they bloody they call it off because it'll be a, a catastrophe. Which is possibly why this stuff was leaked in the first place. I mean, the leaker may not. Yeah, I'm inclined to agree on that basis. Apartment block complex that would be a nightmare to attack head on. So the Ukrainians can hold it there for some time. Most everything else at this point is just flattened suburbs. So there's very little time to unblock Bakhmut if that is indeed what the Russians intend, uh, what the Ukrainians intend to do. So, but they still could do it. Um, what else do we have? Donetsk Axis. Um, I don't think there's much to say on this one. We can look at the personnel. Uh, a lot of Ukrainians deployed here, which makes sense. Um, this area is highly fortified. The Russians have been chipping away at the fortified areas like Ad Adievka and uh, Marinka somewhere. Right there, it is yeah, right here. Uh, um, a lot of the, a lot of these places were hard to crack too. For instance, I think the Russians were stuck outside of Pesky for like three or four months until they took absolutely, it. yeah. Um, and and for the Russians because they've it, they they've expended such effort to take these places, they, they're probably reluctant to pull back from them now. So there's that to take into account as well. And that also protects Donetsk City because that's where the Ukrainians have been yeah. shelling Donetsk from for for a decade almost. Right, and we can see. Uh, 
you know, a large number of uh, Russia's maneuver battalions deployed here. Actually, very few de territorial defense forces, which makes sense because Donetsk is the single critical point of this entire campaign. You yeah. want your yeah. best units deployed here. Um, and, not and notice too, just Charlie, just sorry, briefly, just on that little cluster you had there before, you see the territorial sort of the the sort of so-called ineffectual battalions are clustered around the center, yet both of their flanks are protected by effective units that are also partially mobile as well, which is probably, if you're going to protect vulnerable units, is the best way to do it. Hmm, makes sense, yeah. Um, what else do we have in here? We have this one. Okay, this is interesting. People have talked about. Uh, here you can see U.S. NATO Special Operations Forces in Ukraine. There's 90... There's 100, basically, in Ukraine. This is not weird. These are probably not deployed in combat roles. They're probably there training uh, Ukrainians uh, behind the lines. From my understanding, um, NATO does not want its people in Ukraine, and it has told them do not go there. So I don't, I don't think we actually have special forces operating on the front lines. There are volunteers. There are plenty of like Polish troops and whatnot. As far as the United States goes, these are probably just uh, way in the rear um, in like Lvov or Kiev or something training. Uh, and of course, you want your special operations, uh, your most professional people. That's who you're going to send into this part of the world um, to train the Ukrainian soldiers on. You're not just going to send like random military regulars, right? So I think this just sort of makes sense. And there's actually nothing weird about the special forces um do you guys have anything um, to add there well the only weird thing is that we've consistently denied that there was uh special forces in ukraine we've we you know repeatedly the narrative has been or the, the messaging that has been oh we don't have boots on the ground we don't have boots on the ground well i mean when you talk about you know grave damage to national interest well you've literally just proven the, the official statements of of very high level officials in the united states and nato incorrect and you've you basically proven, oh, we do have people, we do have boots on the ground, even if it's less than 100. But It feels a bit like the Vietnam scenario of having advisors, you know, just being an, a way to sort of confound the idea of actually having military resources there and personnel. Yeah. Um, this part of this uh, paper was very interesting. Uh, I forget what the J4 um, means in military parlance. Uh, I don't know if you can... The, they're specific... Them. There's specific roles, yeah, um, like N4, that's logistics, right, um, or, or J4, I should say. You have N4, A4, you know, um, those are all, that's just the joint version for, that's whoever's in charge. J4 is a specific type of person. Um, he's he's like an actual guy. He's like a, a four-star general who's in charge of, of logistics. Um, so, yeah, and this is just their their segment on, on this slide, and the same thing with J5. They're just, they're just a guy who's in charge of that specific area. So for J4, we have uh, uh, there are multiple launch rocket systems, 28 expended in the last 24 hours, almost 10,000 total expended. I can't read what the 250 is. That might be on hand. Um, yeah, OH it looks like, on hand. Yes. Seven-day burn rate, 14 Zero seven day, eighteenth of March. So basically, a month they... ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm so, so, assuming there's they've been given more like high Mars missiles and whatnot. Um. But yeah, we can all see 155 millimeter rounds. Uh, they expend 1100 a day. Uh, or just 1100 that day. I mean, we don't know, but we can see that uh, total expended almost a million 155 millimeter rounds. On hand, they have almost 10,000. Um, PDA, what is this, 30,000 by 12th of March. Maybe they are expecting 30,000 to be delivered by the 12th of March. PDA due in... I, I, that must be what it means. Um, it looks like the PDA plus USAI due in something in parentheses. Let's see if USAI is on here. Like, Is that on here? USAI. I don't know, but we, what we can see here is they're using way more uh, rounds than they have and can deliver. Um, 
zero yep. <laughs> 4th of March. Presumably they've gotten more. Um, let's see. 155 millimeter and route none. Next uh, 24 is, but, hours, this, 1800. Yeah, this is this is an interesting um, uh, interesting thing to note, right? Because this was in uh, February, like 28th March February. 1st. Yeah, March 1st. This brief was given March 1st. It was compiled on 28th February and their expected rate of expenditure for 150 millimeter for for zero is is like three days from then so that just so we have a, a an idea of how tight the timeline is yes that makes sense because seven if the seven day burn rate is 2700 and in the next 24 hours is 1800 delivered okay someone can do the math but yeah no mlrs coming in no patriots I don't know what IDAMs are. Oh, JDAM. That's so JDAM, JDAM. is, is okay. that's a glide JDAM, bomb. Yeah. That's a that's a glide bomb. Um, so that's JDAM ER. I'm assuming that means extended range. Um, that's an uh, an air to surface bomb. Basically, a JDAM is a glide bomb. You just take a 500 pound or 250 pound bomb, stick a, a, a basic basic guidance system on it, and a pair of wings. And when you drop it, basically it. it it allows you to uh, to because it uses inertia, right, and and gravity in order to attack the target. Um, it gives you the ability to to drop a conventional bomb and give you a little bit of range, so you can drop it outside of the range uh, of air defenses and things like that. Right, so that's what the bomb. Russians have been doing with their guided bombs. Yes, exactly. So five Max Pros on delivery. Uh, what else? Let's see. This air section bilateral training. Um, SE flank BGs, train and advise forces. Yeah, so not a whole lot here. Otherwise, this is just a this is basically a NATO wide daily update map for the Joint Chiefs. Um, anyone wanted to point out anything else here? Well, I mean, you could you could look at um uh position of of like aircraft carriers and stuff, which that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, um, that's generally, like, publicly known. But, yeah, we can look at um, <laughs> George H.W. Bush CSG Carrier Strike Group, um, Adriatic Sea. Underway in the Adriatic Sea, they're doing flight ops, uh, okay. ops sortie 72, oh, that they're just telling you how much aircraft they have. Um yeah, it's, so Adriatic it's, it's, worth, is... it's worth mentioning that the Americans have a fleet based uh, just north of Naples. Basically, the Mediterranean fleet is uh, is located there. Just for the record, I think it's the third fleet, if I'm not mistaken. Next twenty four hours well, in the Mediterranean. No, it's it's six fleet. Sorry, six fleet. You're right, Mandrill. Sorry, my bad. Yeah, Adriatic is the one uh, right next to Turkey. Um. No, that's the Aegean. The no, 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 the, no, the Adriatic is between Croatia and Italy. It's that you see where the right, two the sli- boxes are. The yeah, slim one next to Italy. Yep, yep, yep. My yep. bad. Um, so where one okay. finds the Venetians and the Croatians, etc. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, nothing else really here. Mainly just the special forces and the artillery delivery timelines and whatnot. Um, do we have anything else? There was this one slide about like Israel. Something about oh, yes. trying to convince them to <laughs> give stuff to Ukraine. Like this is the strategy for how to get Israel to send Ukraine stuff. There's like, yeah, let's let's like, try let's try to get the Israelis to not be stingy. Yeah, it's like, it's like, what, like we have to send what, what universe is this? Model. You know, sorry, John. Yeah, this, I I didn't actually read this because it's just so much. It's so funny, like on its face coming up with like plausible scenarios to get them to help. <laughs> well, well um, sp- speaking of the Israelis, right. They have given some, some token like stuff, like medical supplies and, and helmets and body armor and stuff like everybody else. Um, they, a couple months ago, they, and this is where the 155 millimeter ammo comes into play. Uh, they were kind of mad at us because apparently there was a stockpile in, in Israel and there's another one in South Korea and we were basically just like uh no we're we're taking these these are these are our rounds now and we're just going to take them out of your country and and send them to Ukraine. And so they were kind of uh, a little bit seemed like maybe butthurt about that. Um the other thing um which really it's it's unknown um 
But uh, there have been indications of Israeli built MRAPs ending up in Ukraine. Um, there's been footage of, of this um, on Twitter that we've, we've seen, like, especially during the offensives by Liman and Kherson, right? Um, but of course, it, nowhere is it listed that Ukraine or Israel has given any sort of such offensively, you know, minded aid to Ukraine at all. So um, yeah, that's uh, one of those weird mysteries, right? You know, hmm. We just don't know. So I think there was also, more stuff uh, about like Putin having surgery too. I don't know what this is. I don't have all the documents. Uh, sorry, Marcus. What? No, no question. Very briefly, this is actually an interesting standpoint of geopolitics and di- diplomacy and how it plays out. Is that, for instance, um, I, I think it might have been uh, Alex McCurris making this observation that sort of there's a bit of a dimorphism with within Israel per se because obviously a lot of people you might say of, of um, of dis, of descent who have repatriated themselves to Israel since um, its foundation in forty eight. Many of them came from Russia itself, or you know, from form, the former so you know the former Russian Empire. They sort of have an inclination towards um, being from a diplomatic standpoint. And also during the Cold War as well, Israel was one of the sort of countries that sort of had a foot in in you know in either camp because obviously you received a lot of aid from you know Britain and, and the USA, and they helped establish Israel from the onset. So Israel sort of has this partially uh, slight, uh, a part of them sort of aligns with the East and with with uh, and with Russia and with Eastern Europe. And then there's another portion of them, probably more of a, of a slightly liberal orientation, who very much identify with London, Washington, New York, and are aligned westwards. And it's kind of interesting how even domestic Israeli politics reflects this, where, say, like Netanyahu is seen as someone who can probably engage to some degree with rapprochement with Moscow. And to some degree with Beijing, and and if, for instance, the whole NATO American thing, you know, pardon the phraseology, shits the bed, someone like Netanyahu could possibly orient it to some degree east east facing, where say, for example, the more liberal left elements of of um, Israeli politics very much align pro Western, and if this sort of NATO arrangement and Western hegemony and the petrodollar and all of that falls in on itself they don't really have a plan B. So that kind of demonstrates how even the, you know, the IDF and the defense policy within Israel is kind of caught in knots about this issue as well. Not that it really matters. It's just because we're on this point it's worth mentioning. Yeah. So this is interesting, interesting what I have highlighted here as well, uh, because Ru- the United States has a vested interest in Russia helping Iran with their weapon programs, including nuclear, um, which I think is interesting. But sorry, Mantle, were you going to add something there? Oh, no, I was just going to piggyback off of the Netanyahu point, but I'm sure everybody else has heard that. Yeah, so this is interesting. I haven't actually read these. What are the other ones? Israel expands outreach to the U.S. for counter Iran. So more stuff with Iran and in relation to Syria as well. So this is interesting, basically, because the... The U.S. has motives to get the Russians to do certain things in the Middle East and the Near East in order to drag Israel into the conflict. Um, I think we've reviewed everything I have. Before we move on to the stuff you have brought in, Vangel, and the deep research you've done... Do you want to talk a little bit about like the leak and how these documents would get out, who these documents are like intended for, that sort of thing? Sure. Um, so, I mean, of course, you can see on the top left, right, that's the, um, the symbol of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, right? So um, these are our daily briefings. Um, so the Joint Chiefs of Staff are going to be receiving – this PowerPoint, right? And people have a lot of questions about, okay, how genuine is the document? Like, where did this come from? And and so do I, right? That's an unanswered question is how does a, a very junior person who's not even in the active duty military, he's, he's a reservist, right? He's an, you know, air, um, an air national guard member, right? How does that kind of person who's not, how does he get into the, into such a high level area? 
And, and this is what some people have speculated on, um, you know, whether they, when they don't think that the document is, is genuine. Um, I've seen enough uh, of these PowerPoints in my time. And, and to me, this looks genuine. Um, uh, so who is this intended for? Well, it's intended for the Joint Chiefs of Staff and especially the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who's going to be there talking to the President and all the all those people in the Pentagon, right? Um, uh, the way that this uh, works, right, um, is you're not allowed uh, any sort of um, access to between secret, uh, in other words, confidential systems and unclassified uh, computer systems specifically, right? Um, so there's, there's not allowed to be any crossover. You're not allowed to have things like USBs or, you know, hard drives or anything like that. Right. Um, the, so there's, there's no transferability between systems, right? So in order to get access to these documents, you have to have clearance. Um, and an interesting thing to note, um, just from military culture is that when you have these big, these big briefings where you have big wigs or ex like very highly classified secrets, um, the room that these are in is usually, um, uh, like guarded. I, won't, I shouldn't say guarded. It's there's, there's usually a sign posted on the door and, you know, somebody's outside, some junior officer, gopher person is usually standing outside and saying, hey, classified briefing is, is in progress, right? Um, and so really junior personnel don't get access to these documents usually. Um, they don't see these kinds of briefs. They're, they are restricted in who is allowed to see them. Um, and just to speak on, on how these documents get transferred, um, there's usually... A, a folder that that you have, right? It, um, it's like a, a cardstock folder, right? Um, and in order to take these documents by hand to certain places, you have to put them inside of the folder. The folder is labeled um, with a, a cover sheet, which has a secret, you know, unclassified, etc. cetera. Um, so it, it literally visually uh, denotes what kind of document is contained uh, within that uh that folder when you carry it around by hand um so the question is how did such a person get access to this document in the first place and it's it's an open mystery as to how um this very junior personnel uh, got these documents i mean you can tell right they look crumpled up they're they're obviously you can see the fold marks in in, in the photograph of them right so this person when all of these this powerpoint is stapled together or or collected together um, uh, every single person in, in the room who's a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff when they get this briefing, like in usual with these kinds of, of briefings of, of senior personnel, right? They always have the PowerPoint, right, on a screen that they can see. And they also get a, a like physical hard copy of the PowerPoint slides itself, right? And so they can, if they don't want to look at the screen, they can look at their little, their little piece of paper, right? Um, they, they like paper a lot. Um, so, you know, it's, it's interesting um, because, um, he, you know, the joke is, you know, we've probably looked at these slides for, for way longer than the actual person that this brief was intended to, right? Um, so the, um, the, the scenario that I can easily imagine here of how such a person would be able to get this document is, um, you know, uh, he, the, this thing was probably lying around in a room after the brief was over. It, it, may, it probably wasn't collected, and and somehow it ended up in a place where this this uh, extremely junior enlisted personnel uh, was able to pick it up and put it in his pocket. Um, so that's uh, how this document probably got into into his hands. That seems like a, a likely outcome. I mean, uh, the other possibilities is that there's like a chain of conspirators leaking them down and he is just the one posting it on the internet. I don't really think that's particularly likely. Um, other possibility is these weren't even in the room and these were 
uh, leaked digitally somehow and then just printed out on pieces of paper like this and then photographed to uh, make you think that these were the pieces of paper in the room. I don't think that's particularly likely. I think what you ba what you described there is as cascading security errors in some sense is probably yeah yeah and and um it's this does not look good on on any of the dod for sure um this just represents that there's multiple levels of when you have a, a failure like this right um because obviously it should have been in a folder and marked instead of being like folded up and put somewhere um so that's one security breach um how such a person got access to this document in the first place. That's probably another one. Um, and uh, there's at least another one, um, you know, with, with it being posted on online, having a classified document being posted on the internet. That's a third one, right? So that's three, third times the charm for sure. Yeah. And I guess as far as the motive goes, I mean, I, for one, we have to assume that the person they've arrested is even the person who actually did, which, you know, maybe they are. Um, also, you know, the, the motive could be anything. I mean, he could have literally just wanted to show off. Um, there's been some stories about him being like allegedly far right or something. Um, I mean, one thing that's interesting that people have to remember is a lot of the far right are the most like rabidly pro Ukraine Spurgs I've ever seen. Um, it's not actually a common position on the far right to um, not be a fan of Ukraine, which is interesting because basically if he's as Spurgy as the um, like details in the media uh, posted, I would suspect he would tend to lean towards calling all this offensive because it's going to fail. But that's just me speculating a little. I guess I'm saying, like, don't assume that the leaker is, like, pro-Russian or something just because they call him far right because that's not necessarily the common opinion. Um, well, whether it's amongst ourselves or the chat, Charlie, it's fair enough to say that this issue does sort of tend to break down the middle in many ways. Indeed. Um, okay, should we move on for the documents now and look at what uh, you've provided, Mandrel? Yeah, sure. I'll bring this up. This giant thing. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just zoom in, and I don't know if you have other information you're looking at, but uh, I'll scroll through this however you want. Mm, I think the, the I mean, we know Ukraine's been at, at um, receiving U.S. money, and, and they've been at full mobilization for a year now, so we can probably skip the... the Mm -hmm. um the important part and and i haven't really looked at at some of the other things um in terms of equipment but the main thing is the tanks and the armored vehicles um those uh weapons uh their quantities are known they are announced um we know exactly how many uh both sides roughly have uh more or less right these are these are kind of ballpark numbers right you can see obviously the plus sign on on um, these things for which side has which kind of weapon and storage. Um, um, so I did a little digging, right? Um, and I found some sources uh, and compiled a numerical value as to how many uh, armored vehicles uh, that Ukraine has been given by the West. Um, other forms of aid like Artillery and, and MLRS systems are a little more difficult to uh, either A, quantify, because what counts as artillery? Um, does that mean, or do you count a mortar as artillery, right? Um, or do you count, um, uh, or they've just not released uh, the numbers for, for the artillery pieces that they've given in some cases, right? Some countries have declined to do that. Um so uh, obviously artillery, as we know from Jimmy Thomas' videos, are, are the decisive elements in warfare. But I think it's good to find a metric uh, for losses here. And so I, I did some digging and, and just I wanted to uh, uh, show everybody in terms of armored vehicles um, how uh, much uh, Ukraine has been given and, and what the Russian claim is as to how much they've destroyed, right? Um, so... 
I won't give you the full list. You can find it on uh, on places like Wikipedia and, and Oryx, right, for what aid has been given to Ukraine. Um, but if you notice, Ukraine started this war out with um, roughly, uh, what is that, uh, 2,500 tanks plus uh, and 2,800 armored vehicles. 2,750. So 2,750, yeah. So you know, roughly 2,800 and, and the same amount in armored vehicles um, plus, and that's, that's – armored vehicles is a broad category here. That in, in the Ukrainian pre-war context, that's like BMPs, um, basically the thing that you would stick an, an infantryman in and, and cart him around in, in the battlefield, right, with a 50 cal machine gun or, or a 20-millimeter gun on top, right? That's what we're talking about. Um, I'm also, for my purposes, going to count Humvees as well uh, to be generous because a Humvee is uh, – or any sort of motorized infantry force is basically what you'd use for that purpose. And the same thing with an MRAP, right? An MRAP is, is an armored vehicle, right? Um, even though it's a wheeled and, and, you know, infantry carrier, it's not an armored personnel carrier, like an M113 per se. Um, so please excuse the broadness of, of category here. Um, but I just want to give people ballpark numbers. So you've got, those numbers right there, and so bear that in mind. Um, uh, the total tanks that the West has given, like, and this is counting everything, right? Everything, including the stuff that's that's hasn't arrived in Ukraine as of our, our briefing slides here. Um, that is nine hundred and sixty-seven plus total tanks, um, and armored vehicles of all types. Um, from everything from Humvees to MRAPs to armored medical treatment vehicles to, you know, M2 Bradleys, et cetera, um, all of that, including the old Soviet BMPs that the Eastern Bloc countries have given, um, that is 5,999. Um, so if you add that number of just under 6,000 with the total Ukrainian armored vehicles circa 2014, because this slide is, is from 2014. Um, it hasn't really changed much. The Ukrainians didn't get any real armored aid uh, af until the invasion started. Um, if you put those numbers together, you end up with a figure of 11,384 total Ukrainian vehicles. Um, and that's that's there's a plus sign next to that, of course, because we don't fully know um, some of these uh, uh, quantities, right? Uh, some of the the announced weapons haven't been given, even with with tanks, right, uh, or armored vehicles. We just don't know. Um, like for example, Italy being a primary example of what we don't know that they've given. Um, so. There's another, uh, the Russians have been making daily announcements, right, of how much they they kill. Um, and today, the amount of tanks and other fight, armored fighting vehicles that they have claimed as of yesterday is 8,677. So if you run the math on that, um, the Russians are claiming that they have destroyed 76% of Ukrainian armor. So going back to our casualties uh, slide, um, you don't have to bring that up. It's okay, Charlie. Um, I'll bring it up. But, I was just okay. looking at my more modern counts and comparing them while you talked. Yeah. So if you, if you think about, okay, if Ukraine has lost 76% total losses in terms of armored vehicles, how many, how many people get killed in an armored vehicle? Like I'm assuming I'm of course, you're assuming that not every armored vehicle is going to get blown up. You've seen plenty of combat footage of somebody, you know, dropping a grenade out of a drone into a BMP or a T-72, et cetera, right? Um, so not every armored vehicle gets killed uh, with people dying uh, necessarily. But if you wanted to take that number just as, as a ballpark and, and calculate that with, you know, two or th maybe three guys dying... Right? Which would that's, be a low that's, estimate. That's, yeah, the low estimate of, of 8,677 8, times by two is 17,354 KIA. Right. Okay. 
So just from the armored vehicles, then you'd have this many KIA. And I guess you're much more likely to be killed in a destroyed vehicle than... And, right. And, and would you say, Mandrel, that in the event shot. of a successful penetration and destruction of an of a armored vehicle, that even in the event that the entirety of the crew, the crew isn't killed, the majority will be. So if there is, in fact, a survivor, it might be one or two. It's never that, oh, one crew member's killed and the rest survive. Usually it's the opposite, in the event that there are survivors. That's correct. Um, and of course, this is also, you have to think about, okay, well, what happens when a BMP gets hit with an artillery shell or something like that? And okay, the crew gets gets not killed and maybe three or four guys out of the squad and riding in the back get you know killed or wounded on top of that, right? Um, so um, there, these numbers are inexact and they are not precise, but I just wanted to give everybody a, a idea here on, specifically from the Russian side and the Russian claims of what they've knocked out. Um, and of course, tanks and armored fighting vehicles, um, I'm using as a category uh, because... One, it isn't um, um, it isn't a fluid category, right? There's not a lot of uh, things that you can describe as a a tank or an armored fighting vehicle, right? That's a, a catch-all lumped together category, right? Um, so you're not talking about a truck with a 50 cal on the back. That's that's a different kind of vehicle, right? Um, you're talking very specific everything that's a Humvee and, and, and greater, right? Um, it's, it's not like, a uh, any sort of aircraft or things like that either, which can, can possibly, you can say, okay, well, an airplane or a helicopter that got shot down. Well, all right. You can maybe count something that's a UAV or, or you, 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 you see what I'm talking about, right? Civilian usage, helicopters or civilian usage airplanes, you can count in, in that count as well, whereas a tank is a tank is a tank, right? It's not a civilian vehicle. It cannot be construed as a civilian vehicle, it can't be counted for casualties in the same way. Um, so yeah, um, it's interesting. Um, you you do have the slide with that, uh, with that particular daily kill count, right, Charlie? I, I did send that to you, right? Um, just DM it to me on, on Twitter. I, I think I did actually. Let me check. I might have missed it because I ended up closing Twitter. Yeah. Um, um, take a look. I'm going to look for it. Take a look at these numbers for their armored fighting vehicles in 2021. It's actually pretty similar. Um, oh, I see. You sent me some other things beforehand. Let me download those real quick so I can share them. But yeah, you'll notice I think there's like 31, 3,200 vehicles listed very specifically in that section there in their army. Mm -hmm. um, which that would that absolutely checks out with what the Russians say that they've killed. Um, let me just do a little quick more math while you're looking for that. Um, yeah, I found it. Uh, I'll bring it up in just a second. Did you send me two yeah. of the same image right there? Uh, no, one of them had a typo and was the the Russian one from today. Um, I'm that one had a, a typo, so I, I got rid of that one. Um, I'm looking for the one from yesterday for the fifteenth. There we go. Oh, okay, that's the twelve. That's, that's from a couple days ago. Um, and yeah, but this one is the fifteenth. There we go. Yeah. So it, running my the math a little bit, right? Um, if we compare, um, the casualties here, right? Um with combining all of the total aid of all armed and armored vehicles and tanks and all that, and then you subtract that by the total um, kill count, right, of 8,677, not only is that a 76% loss of armor, that means that the amount that your thing, uh, your little globalist uh, um, document there, which says that the Ukrainians have about 3,000 armored vehicles, um, the, my math comes out to after you might subtract casualties from the total amount of, of vehicles that Ukraine could have had at the start of conflict and has been provided, that total number is 2,707, right? So... And what is that 000, number, 2,707? Yeah, which that number that you have um, on the Global Homo document right yeah. there, um, they say they have 3,000 armored vehicles. Yeah, roughly. Right. Roughly. 
of yeah, all types. Total these up: MBT, reconnaissance, armored personnel carriers. I don't know what IFV is. Um, Infantry um, fighting vehicles. That's a that's uh, a Humvee. Okay. okay. Yeah. So. Yeah, about three thousand, thirty-two hundred or so. Yeah. So that's you know that's not that far off. So you're looking at a ballpark figure of around three thousand total armored fighting vehicles of, of every single type, right? Um, so, um, that seems to me to be fairly accurate. Um, and of course the, the numbers aren't going to be totally precise, like I said, because, um, some of the, the countries just simply never announced the quantity or, or announced that they were giving some weapons anyway. Um, well, the number makes sense too, because, okay, let's say you, Russia lost 6,000 vehicles here. That's a lot. They probably lost a lot in those initial advances on Kiev, but I would imagine that Ukraine has lost similar numbers of vehicles, which aren't even listed here. I mean, if we note these numbers for Ukrainian losses seem really low, like 32 rotary, rotary wing aircraft. Russia claims 228 here. I mean, one way this happens is, you know, if multiple people are sh shooting at the same vehicle or helicopter or whatever, and it goes down, it can be double reported or triple or even more. Um, so Correct. if you see numbers inflated, it's not necessarily like propaganda, although it can be that too. Uh, obviously, anyone who shoots the thing down or can claim to do it is going to report that so that their unit looks better. So yeah, these numbers are definitely higher than they ought to be. How high, obviously we don't know, but you know, I, you're, the math you did based on these numbers is, is, is useful. Um, and yeah, yeah if, I, if we look at artillery too, 1,818 pieces in 2021, this says 1952. So they probably have artillery in other branches as well, because I'm just looking at army here. Uh, if we look at Navy, see Navy also has some APCs, uh, armored fighting vehicles and its own artillery, um, air forces. Yeah, I've got. I'm going through this on my blog. So if you check out my Substack after, I'll have some of these numbers in there. Um, yeah, and this is not to say that, and, and this is one of the reasons why I have problems with the the source known as Oryx. Because, um, okay, well, you have a T62 or a T72 get, you know, knocked out with the treads knocked off. Okay, somebody picks it up and takes it back to the shop and repairs it and then puts it back into service on their side because they have, you know, spare parts interoperability with the Soviet gear. Okay, then it gets, two weeks later, it gets knocked out and KIA totally. Okay, who's, whose tank is it, right? This is, and, and that's probably not a very large amount uh, of vehicles that is, you know, changing hands, but you just think about, okay, well, um, it opens up the possibility that not every everything that's being killed is necessarily a Ukrainian tank or a Russian tank per se originally, right? Um, the conflict has been going on long enough now where, where combat losses and, and uh, captured vehicles have accrued on both sides. So just because some like some tank is is you know knocked out or blown up in Ukraine doesn't mean that it was originally on one side or the other. Mm -hmm. Also, I just realized that I was counting wrong. I was looking for tanks. They have main battle tanks right here under armored fighting vehicles. So mm. this is not counting. This is not adding up to 30-something hundred. It, it, it does seem like they basically have exactly as many uh, other armored vehicles as they did before. Um, main mm. battle tanks, 1150 plus 1400 storage. I mean, if we just look at the... Let, let's, let's go back and look uh, over here. The Russian losses are, what, 6,000 vehicles total? And this, I'm getting lost. This says they have, like, what, 45,000 crown vehicles? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Plus, I'm sure they have more since 2014. So, like, they've lost 10 to 15%, probably, let's say, 15% of their total ground vehicles. So, like, uh, I mean... This this six thousand number seems huge until you realize like, just how many vehicles that Russia has uh, in its inventory. I mean, so yeah, and of course, a lot of that is going to be the lowest, especially in the initial phases of the invasion. They're going to be losing the lowest of the low tier uh, in terms of T seventy twos and um, 
uh, BTRs and uh, uh, um, you know BMP variants of, of various type, right? Um, so just old Soviet kit that's been sitting around and hasn't been used yet. So, yeah. Or T-62s, famously, with the Russians, because they are using T-62s. How many helicopters did I count? Yeah, I counted 55 helicopters in 2021 based on reading this. So this number must be exaggerated unless they've been given tons of new mm. helicopters. I don't know if you counted that or not. Um, no, I, I haven't looked at, at air assets, helicopters unfortunately. are easy to exaggerate. Just in that book, 85 Days in Slavyansk, I read, there were reports of multiple down helicopters because like three different units were shooting at it. So because a helicopter is so visible, um, I would expect this number to be inflated. So mm. that's interesting. I mean, either way, I mean, even if we look at the NATO sources, it's, it literally says right here that they have lost like, I mean, look, if I go back to their aircraft, 125 combat capable aircraft in their air forces in Ukraine uh, in 2021, and they've lost what, uh, 60 so it's like that's basically half. I mean, back in March. So hmm. that's that's yeah. sixty fighter, sixty fighters, fighter bombers, and rotor and rotor wing. Yeah. So it's, it's yeah. I mean, uh, I don't know what all these types are. I'm assuming these are mostly fighter bombers. Um, I I know what those are. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. So the the MiG twenty nine that's a fighter. Su twenty seven that's a fighter. Uh, SU-24, that's an older, it's still a fighter. SU-25, that's, um, that's the Frogfoot. The Russians like to use that a lot too. That's, a that's basically the Soviet version of the Warthog. It's an air to ground attack aircraft. Um, uh, let's see. That's, oh yeah, you, you can even see like FTR, that's fighter, FGA. Uh, I don't know what that acronym is, but ATK, that's attack, right? Mm -hmm. ISR, that's intelligence signals and reconnaissance. Um, and the other ones, that's, uh, IL-76, I don't know what that is. Uh, Tupolev-134, I don't know what those are. Uh, yeah. Oh, transport, probably. Well, we yeah. can see most of these are fighters. 71 fighters, 31 attack, um, 14 other fighters, so combat capable. So, yeah, this is adding up to more than 125, so I guess... These are combat capable, and some a lot of these are just like support aircraft and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, yeah, Ukraine has. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Ukraine has been given uh, helicopters by a variety of nations now, um, like Mi nine, Mi seventeen. They've been definitely been given the old Soviet hind attack air helicopter as well. Um, yeah, so it's not like they don't have, they're not receiving stuff at this mm -hmm. point um, in terms of air assets. Okay, is there any more number crunching you want to do? Did I even scroll through this whole thing? Uh, artillery, yeah, combat capable aircraft. That's interesting that they rated as 231 here, but I don't think it's yeah, high according to that recent document. Yeah, that might be. Just calculating all of them right all all aircraft or all combat aircraft or something but yeah. even the ones that are even the ones that are hangar queens right the ones that don't do anything they just sit in the hangar for and used for spare parts right so on on I mean, paper, this is relevant to um this this naval stuff because they don't this this is related to like a uh, Dnieper crossing right like ukraine doesn't have the uh they literally have two like i've talked about these in one of my vlogs before like they don't have the equipment to cross the Dnieper river in like an offensive so they've been given boats um by nato powers right um specifically some of the special forces boats i think um, but that's not enough to to you know carry tanks across or anything right you need a bridge right exactly it's like this one i think can carry tanks and that's it. <laughs> yeah, there's also six, the, the, six, six, six main battle tanks. Yeah. yeah. But then yeah. there's also the conundrum too, where the soldiers or whether it's fighting vehicles is then once they're across the river like the Dnieper is then supplying them. And whether if Ukraine can barely get those troops across the river, then the prospect of them getting supplies across is even more precarious of, 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 of the notion. 
Yeah, I mean, there, there's no offensive happening here from the Ukrainian side. It just cannot happen. The Ukrainians have launched commandos at this nuclear power plant in order to blow it up and cause an international incident because, you know, that's just what they do on that uh, on uh, Team NATO is, just, you know, cause nuclear fallout for the lulls. But, uh, you yeah, know, there's an offensive in Zaporizhia. Like, like seriously, that's why there's so many Russians here because yes. Ukraine literally just, just bombs this plant and literally <laughs> tries to launch amphibious assaults across if this two-mile river. If they were ever successful, they, they would literally just be atomic lol cows because that's essentially what they're attempting to do just for the sake of generating the the, uh, the controversy. Yeah. Um, fortunately, Russia's not allowing that. So, But yeah, again, back to this offensive possibility here. They can't support it back in here. So anyway... I feel like we're kind of reaching a wrap-up point now. Um, you guys have concluding statements you want to make, or is there anything else you want to touch on that we haven't? I'm good. I've said my piece. Yeah. Um, I don't really have anything else to say either. Um, I think we've, I mean, we've covered this stuff in greater detail than the Joint Chiefs of Staff do. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, like, o- overall... I don't actually find this leak that uh, controversial. Like the fact that it was leaked itself is a much bigger deal than the contents. I mean, the contents more or less say that Ukraine is in a really bad state. We basically already knew that. Um, This stuff is more than a month old anyway. So it's definitely interesting, but I don't find that there's any great revelation here. You know, we do know that there are officially um what is it 100 special forces deployed that's interesting to actually see but yeah overall i think this the contents itself don't actually undermine ukraine in any significant capacity other than maybe some specifics about what these units are made up of but you would expect this sort of thing anyway for the russian side um if ukraine was going to launch a defensive i mean it's not like the russians don't know that these leopards and challengers and other equipments are coming in so yeah um yeah. i think we've covered most things there is actually something i did want to answer in the chat but the problem is just because of the scroll down so far now i actually cannot um find it per se other than to say that I almost find that, I mean, listen, I'm all for people sort of expressing what they feel and to engage in dialogue, like that's absolutely fine. But I mean, this isn't obviously about the justification for it and all the reasoning for the war. We're not, this stream is specifically about these documents and leak. And I actually find it a little bit disingenuous that for the amount that say myself or, or, or Charlie or Mandra or others in this fee have actually spoken about this war and where we've met, done so, we've actually cast our opinions or we've, given um like an objective perspective on it if we haven't if 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 people in our sphere and our friends haven't taken it what we've said at face value now then i doubt that it's actually going to be taken on face value so you know perhaps we could save each other the the grief of having to explain past each other and just give up on the fact that some people obviously just gonna you know shill one way or the other like the fact that Oh, well, what's the reasoning for feeling the way that you do? Well, we've articulated and we've articulate, articulated many times. So let's maybe just save ourselves the, the grief in the comments, fellas. It's, you know, <laughs> I'm just putting it out there for the viewers because it just, it, it just gets a little tiresome. Like we've, we've, we've got, we've, this is well hashed out. You know, this isn't in any way ambiguous. Yeah, no, that's a really good point, actually. I mean, I think a lot of this is just sort of needlessly controversial with like, these intense arguments over like picking sides and stuff. I mean, I'm just, all I've been doing this whole war is just analyzing the maps. And now we have documents like this and. Mm-hmm. Oh, <laughs> it's, actually, it's, right just, it's, it's just proving what we already know. And if you have any understanding of military strategy or any understanding of history or any understanding of geography um, or any understanding of, of basic military fundamentals, to, to put it bluntly. I mean, this, this it, really, I mean, the, the course of this war, um, you know, at least in, in terms of its, its con- inevitable conclusion, it was probably never really in doubt. Um, yeah. No, not really. So, did, yeah, I'm just going to shill I, Jimmy Thomas real quick. Um, yeah. Because, because, uh, everybody... Everybody in the chat should subscribe to Jimmy Thomas. Absolutely. And follow him on Twitter as well. Um, yeah. 
uh, Charlie, just after you shield, I just want to make one more point. But so, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, just that I remember because I saw scrolling through the comments, it couldn't remember what I was going to say. But now, now I do remember what I was going to say. It was, it was pertaining to Israel. And what was interesting um, about the diplomatic moves in the last sort of few months, because it's only really been this last three, four months that this has really been developing. It's interesting how under the guise of, of Moscow's diplomatic plays throughout the, the duration of this conflict, and this is where this domestic political issue within Israel is actually interesting and has taken sort of a new life of its own between, you might say, the, the conservative element of, um, you know, politics in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem versus the more liberal oriented one which obviously is more pro-west but where's the other one is more even-handed between east and west shall i say is that um this so dip, these diplomatic moves by russia has been to sort of create a kind of detente between all of the powers that surround israel so that uh, even though turkey for instance is still selling drones to ukraine um turkey is sort of also joining BRICS or like leaning towards russia um certainly economically speaking you know, Iran has become even more closely integrated towards Moscow and um, and to some extent also China, that the Syrian civil war has basically wound down and the American intervention there has become a failure where the American units there actually find themselves essentially isolated. And yet it is between, um, to some degree, G, but I think it's probably been more driven by, by the de-dollarization and these, uh, you might say, the failed implementation of sanctions. But Putin has managed to get the likes of Erdogan, um, Assad, uh, the Iranian leadership, and also uh, Mohammed bin Salman of Saudi Arabia to get around the same table and more or less see eye to eye and kind of, if not reading off the same hymn sheet per se, they're reading out the same hymn book. And that poses a very significant issue for Israel because Israel has sort of managed to survive by being on favour with, say, the Jordanians or they've been on favour with, the Saudis, they played this party off that party within the context of wider or broader American strategy in the Middle East, whereby the way things are shaping up now, if, say, Turkey, Syria, Iran, and Saudi Arabia all de dollarize, if in the event, since, uh, say, down the track, Turkey even questions its NATO participation, this all pre presents a major diplomatic and economic and military frustration for NATO, for the United States. And I don't think this has really been discussed in, in particularly great detail. I know, for instance, Makuris and, and uh, Duran, they, they talk about this a little bit. But certainly in our sphere, I don't think we've really fleshed it out. And I mean, this is not the stream for it. This was obviously the stream about the intel. But I'm just, it's just worth mentioning, because I know Israel obviously came up in the papers here, that the way that this is sort of coming into being, the way this is sort of evolving over time, definitely looks like a, an existential crisis for Israel, and by extension, it's a military and diplomatic problem for Washington and the Americans. All right. Um, thanks for that. Why is that one video playing? That's weird. Uh, I must have hovered over it when I messed. But yes, so we will go ahead and close out. Subscribe to Jimmy Thomas. A lot of uh, the way I view this war has been informed by his videos, they're very good. Um, I guess echoing what Marcus Furious Pertnax had said earlier, I mean, we're, we're examining things as objectively as we can. Um, you know, I'm uh, learning here and interpreting this stuff with the help of people with military experience and who are very knowledgeable in the history of warfare, like Raging Mangel and Pertnax and others. Uh, Jimmy Thomas, of course, um, did this sort of thing professionally um, as a staff officer, I believe. Um, so, you know, this isn't just random internet opinionating that I'm trying to aggregate here. Um, I'm trying to bring some level of uh, professional knowledge to what we're talking about here. So, yeah, if you have complaints, I mean, I don't know what to say at that point. Uh, I hope everyone has enjoyed the stream. And we, I do still intend to do that uh, stream with Marcus soon-ish covering the Peru video. Um, hopefully we can schedule that as well, but I felt that we needed to cover these leaks. We, we just have to build up our tolerance for the next batch of cringe. <laughs> exactly. Um, all right, so thanks for coming on, guys. Check out their links in the description. You, and um, see you guys next time.